Golden experience. Description. Jobs, hobbies, lifestyles. The world has advanced to a point where nothing can be separated from VR anymore. And now, a VR game was released using the most cutting-edge technologies, its name was Boot Tower, Shoot Curse. Our protagonist had no choice but to play solo during the closed beta test, but once the game officially launched, she made lots of friends, but not necessarily with the players, formed a huge clan, but not a clan of players, and matured as an individual. CH1 Year 12 of the new calendar Before striving to break free from the fetters of Earth's gravity, humanity has poured all its energy into escaping the fetters of the flesh. Through the development of virtual reality technology, once defined as a digital version of reality, now, when the term precedes technology, it has advanced enough that it is no exaggeration to consider it another actual domain of existence. It was initially developed for the purposes of healthcare, but it expanded into education, various infrastructure operations, manufacturing, the service industry, engineering, architecture, real estate, finance, and of course leisure. It had practical applications for every field imaginable and thus advanced society. Huge numbers of office workers connected daily to virtual office spaces. There, they could do work, attend meetings, and even oversee and operate robots that performed work in manufacturing factories. Financial matters were also handled via internet banking and virtual currency, all connected through the use of VR. Legal documents could be signed and notarized in VR. You could even go from getting a loan straight to gambling at a casino. For meals, if you went to the enormous VR grocery store, you could check how fresh food was with your own hands. With the latest full scan technology, products stored in warehouses could be virtually reproduced down to the tiniest detail. Whatever you bought would be immediately packaged and sent right to your home via the underground transportation network. Your purchases would arrive within an hour. The grocery store's warehouses were stocked with produce from a large-scale farm. Using the perfect replication achievable in VR, agricultural technologists can monitor fields and direct the robots to plow, water, or harvest. Sports can also be watched in VR. In stadiums, players' tiniest movements are captured through real-time scanning and the match can be viewed from any angle desired in VR. You can create specialized rooms for friends to join and get rowdy and watch games, or you can go to public spaces to hit it off with other similar fans of your preferred team. If you're feeling ill, you can go to a VR clinic. Your VR equipment can perform scans to give your attending physician real-time updates on your health. You can even have a physical examination, then get any prescribed medications sent to your home that day. If it's something serious that can't be resolved during a standard office visit, unfortunately you'd still have to go to an actual medical facility in person. However, there are no doctors there. You lie on a bed assigned by the medical technologist then medical robots treat you. Of course, you're actually being treated by a qualified physician via VR. Virtual reality was truly another reality. Indeed, this refers to how the VR space has come so close to the real world. However, at the same time, it also refers to the way real world society has come to embrace VR. Boot Tower, Shoot Curse. A new game announced in this modern age. It wasn't particularly innovative, being an orthodox, fantasy map but it was the newest title from a company that had released numerous smash hits. Both fans and the industry had high expectations for it. After several closed alpha and beta tests, they finally announced a large-scale open beta test. The open beta would of course function as the final test before release, but since all the previous tests had already resolved the vast majority of balancing problems and bugs, it was widely asserted that this was essentially just early access to the game. It had been previously announced that the same account would be used for the full release, and that all character data would be migrated as well. Since it was still a beta test, it would be free to play until the full game went live, but it was made very clear that it was possible for the game to go down for maintenance at any time. Before the open beta, only small bits of information about the game were available to the public. The contents of all the prior tests were protected by strict NDAs, and the game was configured so that players couldn't take screenshots or record videos. That said, people still talk. Information about the game was shared anonymously on social media, and it became hard to tell what was true and what was false. In any case, everything would be revealed very soon.
it appears that the basics are all the same from the closed beta. Looking at the character creation mode window, the data displayed here seemed to match what she remembered. This game doesn't have levels. It doesn't have discrete classes either. Even with no levels, you still earn experience, XP, and that XP can be spent to boost stats and learn skills, special abilities, which is how you improve your character. That was the basic gameplay system. After your character is created, this system gets explained and the player receives 100 experience points. There are seven different races, human, elf, dwarf, beastkin, goblin, skeleton, and homunculus. Based on the race you wanted, it could cost experience points, for example, Humans don't cost any XP, and elves cost 20 XP, but goblins give the player an additional 120 bonus XP. It costs 10 XP to raise any stat by 1, and the currently available skills cost between 10 and 40 XP to learn. Everything up to here was the same as it had been during the closed beta. After checking for differences in costs for the learnable skills, it seemed likely that nothing about skills had changed from the closed beta. There had also been skills locked behind prerequisites, so the skills displayed here shouldn't be all of them. In any case, what was interesting was this characteristics category. This hadn't existed during the closed beta. There appeared to be a natural bonus for the character here, which was automatically generated when you first went through the full scan that generates the default avatar. Looking at the help documentation, just like your race, you could only customize it during character creation. Characteristics also involved XP, so letting the system automatically give you a characteristic meant you were letting it spend however much XP was necessary. If you removed the characteristic, you got your XP back, but it looked like it could have a major impact on the avatar's appearance. Innate characteristic, beauty. One time I went to the VR library and happened across a book about an antique game. I think that game had a similar system. 20 XP was pretty expensive, but she felt like she'd lose something else if she messed around with her appearance too much, so she just left it. Whatever. This game doesn't have regular level ups or anything, but the ability to spend experience to strengthen your character could be done at any time. In other words, there was no reason to use the 100 XP during character creation you could just use it later after starting the game. Setting aside the fact that her characteristic used some of her 100 XP. Choosing to be an elf used up another 20 XP. But then she took another characteristic, albinism. Innate characteristic, albinism. XP cost, minus 20. You were born with white hair, white skin, and red eyes. Spending too much time exposed to the sun will afflict you with light burns. Burns, until healed depending on the severity, causes damage over time. A way to get XP back without fiddling with her appearance, basically. If she just changed her schedule so that she only logged into the game at night, she figured she wouldn't suffer too much from the drawback. This game did make it so that enemies were stronger at night, but, personally, she hadn't thought the difference was that much during the closed beta. Plus, elves were already a race with pale skin, so an albino wouldn't really stand out much at all. She reasoned. Since she had already gone this far, she might as well try to get back the 20 XP for picking elf, too. Innate characteristic, poor eyesight. XP cost, minus 30. Your eyesight is poor. You cannot target objects that are too far away. Accuracy against mid-range targets is reduced. Medium. You cannot attack long-range targets. That's a damn harsh penalty. However, if she had no plans to engage with mid- or long-range enemies, then it was more or less irrelevant. Anyway, it wasn't a fatal handicap given that she could get her hands on an item like, say, eyeglasses, or a magical something or other that could shore up the difference. Keeping that in the back of her mind, she finished creating her character. Her character's name was, Rare. She could pick a short name like this both because she was a beta tester and as a natural perk from being an early access player. She currently had 110 XP. Thanks to these innate characteristics, she could start the game with extra XP even after choosing a good race. This was a huge advantage. Assuming that farming XP was the same as it was in the closed beta, at least. CH2. The tutorial could not be shipped. The support AI displayed an overview of basic game information that the player needed to know on top of an image of the game world. That was fine and all, but as mentioned, there was no way to bypass the tutorial, and it would periodically ask did you understand that? 
to check that you were paying attention, so you couldn't even zone out or daydream until it was over. You could skip the tutorial in the closed beta, so some tester must have run into some serious problems after skipping the tutorial for them to have changed it. To summarize, the bits that were probably the most important were, the game system doesn't treat player characters, PCs, and non-player characters, NPCs, any differently to the system. The only difference between PCs and NPCs is whether or not they can receive system messages. The system does not differentiate between NPCs and monsters. While the player is logged out, the avatar remains in the same spot in game and goes to sleep. The tutorial had gone on for nearly an hour when the support AI made sure to emphasize another point. The AI is given to NPCs versus those given to monsters differed in terms of knowledge, but each individual AI was also unique. When that came up, Rare interpreted it as an attempt to instill a sense of ethics or morality. In other words, you shouldn't mistreat NPCs just because they're NPCs. You shouldn't callously massacre monsters just because they're monsters, and you should try to behave with some amount of consideration, something like that. After the unskippable tutorial ended, Rare spawned in some kind of gloomy, damp place. Seemed like some kind of cave or backstreet alley. There was also some kind of sour smell. It was weird that even though there were no lights anywhere, it wasn't pitch black, maybe it was because this was a starting area. Glancing around, as far as she could tell, there were no enemies, no other players either. When starting the game, you can roughly choose your initial spawn zone. There were six countries on this continent, and if you chose one of those countries, there were a number of predetermined locations you could randomly spawn at. Normally, a newly created character would only spawn at a place with enemies of an appropriate difficulty, and an area without enemies would be near a town or village. Using that town or village as a starting point, you would steadily expand your area of operation and eventually move to areas with stronger enemies, that it was the basic progression loop in games like these. However, for those who choose goblin or skeleton as their starting race, being placed somewhere near a human settlement would be problematic. The six countries all belonged to humanity, one mostly had humans, one belonged to the elves, one had mostly dwarves, one mostly beastkin, etc. In the game's world, they were all countries run by these so-called races of humanity. Thus, under the influence of these countries, goblins and skeletons were targeted for extermination. Choosing to be a goblin or skeleton came with all that extra XP to help balance out this disadvantage. For this reason, if a goblin or skeleton were to start right next to town, there was a huge risk of the citizens finding and reporting it and dispatching an extermination squad. If they were to be killed, they'd get a death penalty on top of respawning at the same starting area again, and if soldiers were to patrol the area, they'd be done in again in no time at all. What do you know? A self-perpetuating death penalty awarding system. That said, the soldiers and citizens had rather sophisticated AIs, so if they noticed vanquished monsters repopping in a certain area, they'd set up cages or traps at the spawn location resulting in an endless death loop that could never be broken without outside interference. No idea what would happen if a monster race player were captured alive by the human races, though. And so, to avoid those kinds of instant checkmate situations, you can also select starting areas outside the six countries. The residents of the nations refer to these areas as monster territory. As a matter of course, there were naturally no havens of humanity in the monster territories. While it was hard to guarantee that you wouldn't be attacked by someone of the same race, it was at least better than the no questions asked slaughter you'd face in the human countries. Rare had chosen to spawn in one of those very same monster territories. She was an elf, one of the races of humanity, but she didn't pick a spawn area based on her race. Naturally, she would have to take responsibility for any penalties or hardships incurred by her choice. Since management's policy was well, that's where the player wanted to be. Even if a goblin were to be captured by humans, it was still possible to enjoy the game, unpleasant as it may turn out to be. As an elf, and as someone given the beauty characteristic by the system, it wasn't too hard to imagine what atrocities Rare might suffer if she were to be captured by monsters. She might be forced to reenact one of those scenes only found in thin, self-published books. But the official game response is nothing like that could ever happen, and from a gameplay perspective she would simply have to reskill and she'd be able to keep playing. The AI for the monster races in the starting areas didn't know how to deploy traps after all, 
Unlike human soldiers, the reason that Rare made this choice in spite of the risks was due to her innate characteristics. Albinism, made her weak to the sun, and, failing eyesight, meant that open fields with good visibility would put her at a disadvantage. In all likelihood, this was a cave-type starting area meant for skeletons or something, but due to the random nature of spawns, a simple roll of the dice determined where Rare ended up. Monster races don't want to be involved with any of the six human countries, so since Rare didn't choose a country either, she would naturally wind up somewhere like this cavern for her starting location. In which case, this place must be somewhere in the monster territories, but she wasn't sure which country was the closest one. For an elf like Rare, her surroundings were filled with hostile enemies. If this was a place that skeletons could choose as their starting location, then it stood to reason that there were probably tons of undead monsters. In any case, her first order of business was to secure a base of sorts. She wasn't sure if such a place could be found in this cave. But if she had been a skeleton, she should have been faced with the same problem, so it should be reasonable to find some kind of safe area. As they say, don't overthink, make a decision and take action. If this was actually an alley, then she'd be attacked and fall into an infinitary skill loop. Since Rare hadn't learned any skills yet, she'd have to rely on just her character's base athletic ability. If the starting enemies were the same difficulty as those from the closed beta, then she should be able to handle them barehanded with her current stats. If she could have her druthers, then she hoped they'd be humanoid enemies. Sticking to the wall at the first intersection, she stuck half her head out and peeked around the corner. No one was there. Even though it was dark and she couldn't see anything clearly due to her poor eyesight, she could at least tell that there were no moving objects. After waiting for a bit, still nothing moved. Leaving a mark on the stone wall, she moved over to the right side. Continuing down the path by hugging the wall, she could see a faint light coming from around the next corner of the cave. If that was the entrance, then that would be sunlight and leaving meant she'd take damage. However, it was still necessary to know where the cave entrance was. She cautiously walked toward the light. As she got closer, she could make out the sounds of people talking. There are humans in this monster territory cave. She couldn't be sure they belonged to the human races, though maybe they were monsters who could speak in human tongues. Either way, from the way the voices echoed, it didn't feel like the entrance to the cave was nearby. If the entrance wasn't there, then there was a high chance that someone purposely brought a light source to this cave. Monsters probably wouldn't do that, in which case, they were probably humans. Maybe they were players who also happened to spawn in this place. In order to make sure, she'd have to discreetly verify what exactly was on the other side of the wall. I gotta go pee quick in the back. CH3. Finding this cave was a stroke of good fortune. It was dangerous to wander around for too long in monster territory but this cave was here. It was probably fairly well hidden, but the sharp-eyed Riley spotted it with no problem. They'd make this place their hideout for now. There was no place for these girls in their human countries, after all. The Katkin girls were originally children from a settlement. However, due to the monster territory expanding, fewer crops were being harvested and less game was hunted, so the settlement struggled to maintain itself. When the four of them learned that their families were thinking of selling them off, they ran away. However, children would have a hard time surviving on their own. There was already little to eat around the settlement, after all. Because they were so close to monster territory, they could be attacked by vicious monsters as well. And if the people from the settlement found them, they'd be dragged back and, this time, sold off somewhere. The oldest, Kerry, desperately escaped with her three childhood friends. They ran to the next settlement, hid until it seemed like they wouldn't be found then scavenged for food from the fields. They waited until after dark and snuck into a house near the outskirts of the settlement. All they had were the clothes on their backs, and if it were any colder they might have all perished. They needed warmer clothing. While searching the kitchen for salt, the youngest, Marion, happened to find a pile of laundry. That would be worth taking. Then the house's owner woke up. They were discovered. If they didn't run, they'd be sold off. The second youngest, Remy, got caught. There's no way they could run now. Marion threw the laundry at them, completely covering their face. They let go of Remy. It was now or never. If this person wasn't silenced, the girls would be caught and sold. She grabbed a knife that was nearby. The person had crouched down while getting the clothes off their face. She stabbed them in the back of the neck. She was shocked at how far it went in. After jerking back, they fell to the ground flailing, 
then didn't get back up. She felt no guilt, only relief. All four of them felt that way. The second oldest, Riley, found a whetstone. She always had sharp eyes. The knife was used to cook dinner, and had probably just been sharpened. That's why it slid in so easily. How lucky for them. At least, they didn't find anything worth money, but they stole a hatchet and a hand sickle. They also took the blood-covered clothes. They snuck into another house. This time, they headed straight for the owner. They covered the person's face with the bloody laundry, then ran the knife across their throat. They left the bloody clothes there and took the clean clothes they found instead. This house had salt this time. There were also enough knives for each girl. Before morning came, they left the settlement. After that, they robbed a number of settlements, sometimes killing more people as they ran. About two years passed, and whether it was thieving, killing, hiding, or scavenging, they had gotten pretty decent at it. Back then, they would sometimes run into groups of grown-ups doing the same things they were doing. They would try to run away before they were discovered, but if it was faster to kill rather than run, then they'd kill. These grown-ups had much better weapons than hand sickles and hatchets. Some of them had bows like the one settlement hunters used, or other projectile weapons. The girls had been surprised, but it was incredibly difficult to hit Katkin in a forest at night with a bow and arrow. While Kerry dodged arrows, Marion would sneak up on them and slit their throats. That's how they got their hands on bows and arrows. Another two years passed. They focused on practicing how to use their weapons. If they wore down their blades or lost too many arrows, they would attack other rogue groups to replenish. It was good practice. Unlike the residents of the settlements, these groups had money. With money, they could go to a town and buy food and cloth. That was how the grown-ups in the settlements got clothing and stuff. They spent their days sleeping in hollowed trees or thickets and their nights journeying. It had now been five years since they had left the village they grew up in. At some point, they ended up in monster territory. And Riley found the cave. That was the cave they were in now. From the cave entrance, there was a narrow, winding path. But at the end of that, a large space opened up. The four of them decided to make this cavern their base. This was a rather strange cave, though. They had no idea how or why, but the walls shone with light. Thanks to that, they were able to see without much difficulty even without a fire. Still, it wasn't bright enough for everyday life. So they lit a campfire in the room. Normally, a campfire should produce smoke, but, mysteriously enough, the cave didn't get smoky. It was convenient, though, so they didn't worry about it. There was a tunnel high up in the rear wall, and inside, the path split in two. One path was blocked off, while the other went down a long, narrow incline, ending up at a lake. They decided to make the blocked tof path their toilet area. Thanks to the lake. They wouldn't have to worry about water. Monsters also couldn't get into the cavern. After they finished exploring the cave, Marion went to relieve herself. The other three prepared food at the campfire, but Marion didn't come back. The toilet wasn't far from the entrance to the tunnel, and there was no reason for her to have gone all the way to the underground lake. I'll go check up on her. You guys go ahead and start eating first. After saying so. Kerry climbed up into the tunnel. She didn't see Marion. She decided to peek into the dead-end tunnel. If Marion wasn't there either, she'd go down to check the underground lake. As soon as she rounded the bend where the path split, she felt an impact that robbed her of consciousness. CH4. Oh, I see now. I was wondering why there were humans in monster territory, but it turns out they're just bandits trash mobs for the starting area. After ambushing the bandits one by one in the tunnel, once there were only two left in the big cave, Rare went and knocked them both out, then kicked the first two sleepers down as well. She didn't think she hit them hard enough to kill them, but even after falling down, neither of them woke up from the impact. Thinking back on it, if she had instead met a monster avatar in the monster territory, and everyone around her was the same kind of monster. If they were able to communicate properly, she didn't think she'd be able to casually convert them all into XP. But if she had spawned near a human territory and run into bandits there instead, even if they were players, regardless of if they had a human or monster avatar, she probably wouldn't have hesitated to ice them. Kinda makes you wonder. Keeping the warnings given by the support AI from the tutorial in mind, Rare wanted to stop short of ending lives, just in case. She always could kill them later whenever she wanted but NPCs wouldn't respawn. Plus, even without killing, she could earn tons of XP just by successfully incapacitating them. Actually, 
Combat isn't the only way to earn XP in this game. You can earn XP from crafting, and even in other ways such as stealing it and escaping somewhere no one can find you. The amount of XP received is based on the relative difficulty of the action taken compared to your current overall player status. If a player who hasn't earned any XP at all picks up a craft, they learn way more XP than a player with boosted stats and tons of skills who picks up the same craft. Obviously, succeeding in crafting items awards more XP than failing, so in that respect, when taking up a craft, it was most efficient to raise your success rate as much as possible, having not used any of the 100 XP from character creation, and in fact raising it up to 110. The system considered rare lower than a novice. There was no point in holding on to XP without choosing it, it only had value in the form of improving stats and learning skills. But, looking at it from Rare's standpoint, this was simply her play style. Because of her family circumstances, she had mastered martial arts for self-defense. Their clan had built up a storied reputation of diligence, and it was expected of all children in the family to study hard while they were constantly tutored. They also built up stamina, muscle, and dexterity, learning Aikido and ancient martial arts, adhering to the Confucian concept of Li, and striving for the self-defense ideal of defeating an opponent without receiving a single scratch. This perspective dictated that muscles should not be taxed, so they did not go through typical strengthening exercises. For the children in this clan, what is paramount is femininity and beauty. Naturally. Those who loved martial arts had scorned the school and long complained how they were obsessed with nothing more than an unrealistic ideal. However, with the rapid advancement of VR technology, that perspective was flipped on its head. After all, it was now possible to train the mind as much as desired without training the body. It was now possible to defeat an opponent without using any of your own physical strength. This was the quintessence of Lee. The mind could be disciplined perfectly and the only thing necessary in reality was to align one's body with one's own mental image. As soon as Rare gained awareness, she was spending every free moment in VR training toward this ideal. For her own avatar to have low stat values was actually desirable. The game was balanced around the assumption that the initial XP would be spent. That was what happened in the closed beta, after all. What's more, the expectation that experience would be earned at the same rate as in the closed beta was what led to the idea behind this playstyle. The XP compensation due to increased difficulty was huge, from disadvantaged to same level to advantaged, the difference in XP gained between each level was as high as a factor of 10. When gaining XP through combat, defeating a superior enemy could be worth as much as 100 times more XP than defeating an inferior enemy. However, this was ultimately only thick crafting, in actuality, trying to fight an enemy worth 10 times more XP would usually result in death, and along the same lines trying to craft an item worth 10 times more XP would simply be a waste of materials. Internally, Rare giggled in glee at the unexpectedly huge amount of XP she earned. Her actions just now were worth a total of 300 XP, including what she had to begin with. She now had 410 XP. She wasn't sure why exactly she had gotten so much, but for the time being she didn't plan on using any, opting to think about it later while she tied up the unconscious bandits. They didn't have any kind of rope around, so she stripped them instead. Since it didn't seem like they were going to wake up any time soon, she bound their hands and feet with their clothes. She then rolled the bandits apart, giving them each space, and one by one tried to force them awake. Finally. It was time for her first contact with NPCs. The ambushes didn't count. This was her momentous first contact, and she was pretty excited about it. But once the bandits woke up they just started wailing and thrashing around, rendering any attempts at communication moot. Rare had no choice but to politely placate them whenever they raised a fuss. It seemed like language wasn't getting through to them in this situation, so she had to rely on more primitive efficient methods of persuasion. This happened over and over again as the bandits gradually became more civilized. Finally, first contact was about to begin. Once again, all this placating didn't count. Hey, I guess I'll start by introducing myself. You can call me Rare. As you can see, I'm an elf, and I presume you guys are beastkin? Who's your leader? Ah, let's say that only the leader is allowed to speak. Rare said in a kind voice. The bandit who had been the noisiest fearfully named herself. It's Kerry. Who? 
Uda fucker, fuck, your mama didn't teach you how to speak properly, did she? I'm the one sitting here properly while you guys are tied up on the ground. You should be able to figure out which of us has the power here without thinking too hard, yes, erg. I'm Zor, I'm sorry. I didn't mean an it in by it. My parents didn't teach me. Oh. Is that so? Your household must not have been big fans of education. My misunderstanding. Fuck is a vulgar word, it lacks elegance. I encourage you to take that to heart, otherwise you may experience avoidable injuries in the future. On another note, you seem to be having difficulty speaking. Would you perhaps like a magic potion? Saying that, Rare pulled an LP, life point, potion from her inventory and placed it in front of Kerry. Inventory is a function usable after starting the game for players to store things they obtain. During the closed beta up until now, there hadn't been any stories of full inventories, so no one knew the maximum number of items it could store. This potion was included in everyone's inventories from the start, Rare now had 9 left. In the closed beta, they only started with 5, but players also received a starting weapon that matched one of the skills they learned, since she didn't get a weapon. Maybe that's why she started with 5 additional potions. In any case, it was hard to say that she had too many. While normally you might think having 5 would be a lot, if she had to use 4 here on the bandits, it was hard not to feel the loss. Peering at the LP potion with uncertainty, Kerry let out a groan. What's? What's that? Poison. Are you gonna kill us? You don't even know what a potion is? Aren't they pretty common? Maybe just not in this region? During the close, some time ago. When I was in town, I'm pretty sure they could be purchased from all sorts of shops. No way. DA only things you can buy are clothes and food. Oh, really now? This is a magic potion that heals wounds. It can't completely heal everything, but it should at least make it so you can talk more comfortably. Here, I'll help you drink it, so don't move. She opened the vial and poured the potion into Kerry's mouth. Apparently the wounds in her mouth stung since she pulled a grimace for a second but that quickly passed as she looked up at Rare in surprise. It was then that Rare thought for the first time, maybe these four girls weren't bandits, they were an armed group of dirty girls in a cave in monster territory. It seemed self-evident that they lived here, and they did attack her right away, but it was possible that there was a more peaceful explanation for their being here, perhaps they were mercenaries who had been tasked with exploring this area. Perhaps they were hunters from a nearby village who just stopped by to rest. Assuming that the only things near a spawn point would be trash monsters was peak metagame mentality. Thinking back on it now, this game more than any others wouldn't conform to ideas like that. When the game was first announced, they claimed this groundbreaking new game would push the boundaries between games and reality, and it was rumored to be a test of a working world simulator. If there were any truth to that rumor, then another world simulator wouldn't have separate special environments for each and every player. Looking at the facts, there's no way mercenaries wouldn't know what a potion is, and hunters would have at least heard of them. It also felt like they only had weak connections to the town and village community, so the bandit theory was the overwhelming frontrunner. But, now then, if the pain's gone, let's talk a bit. Tell me about yourselves. How you lived up until now? and what you want to do going forward. CH5. In all her fights to the death, Riley had never been beaten so badly before. If it ever felt like she would get done in, she would immediately run, but she was even able to squeeze out a victory when attacked by monsters or wild beasts. None of their group had ever suffered a serious wound. The white girl in front of her was unnaturally powerful. She wasn't that tall, at the same time. She wasn't that short either. Probably around the same height as Riley. The fact that her ears were on the sides of her head piqued her interest. But if she remembered correctly, that was in fact where those elf people were supposed to have them. Her white hair went all the way down her back, and it barely swayed at all as she dodged Riley's attack. She's really strong or she's really fast. Neither of those assessments were true at all yet none of Riley's attacks were effective. She immediately realized that it was because the white girl was doing something. Even though both she and Remy had engaged her at the same time, they were both completely powerless. Riley had a feeling that she had to do something or they were sure to lose. And that premonition came true. At some point she blacked out, and when she woke up, all four of them were tied up and lying on the ground. Kerry was struggling and flailing, trying to get free. But the white girl just touched her or grabbed her and then Kerry began to scream and cry like she had never before. The white girl frowned, wanting Kerry to be quiet. 
and slapped her. It looked like that cut Kerry's lip, and she began to bleed. Seeing that, Riley, Remy, and Marion all began to raise hell, but they quickly stopped. It was the most well-behaved they had ever been in their entire lives. They had never seen the patient Kerry cry like that. They didn't think they'd be able to take the punishment she was getting. After that, every time Kerry caused a scene, the same thing would happen again. Eventually, Kerry also became quiet and obedient. The white girl gave her name, and Kerry did the same. Kerry's rough way of speaking caused the girl's mood to sour a bit, which made everyone else's faces pale in turn. After calming herself, the white girl made Kerry drink something from a weird little bottle. Almost immediately, Kerry's swollen cheeks deflated, and her face returned to how it usually looked. Kerry's eyes became as round as plates. As she looked back at the girl, the other three girls all did the same. So this was what a magic potion did. Kerry began telling the story of how they got here. The other three girls piped in with details when necessary too. They thought the girl would get mad if they spoke up without permission, but instead she just smiled and listened. Maybe the white girl was actually a nice person. They attacked her, but she didn't kill them, and it didn't feel like she was going to take them somewhere to sell them off either. If she wanted to sell them, she didn't need to ask Kerry about their past and she wouldn't have needed to use a magic potion on Kerry either. They had never met a human like this, and not in the sense that she wasn't a beastkin. If their mothers had been like this girl, strong and kind, the four of them might well still be living in the settlement even now. Riley wondered if the other three girls were thinking the same thing. Kerry kept talking while crying. She was the most patient one among them, so Riley thought she didn't cry but she was wrong. Carrie just thought she couldn't cry since she was the oldest. She had to be strong, for them. Since the white girl was here now, and she was stronger than Carrie, Riley hoped that Carrie didn't have to hold it in anymore. Asterisk. After hearing the general story of the bandits lives, Rare heaved a sigh. It was certainly a lot heavier than she was expecting, but from the way they told the story, it was clear that the girl's memories were based on their actual experiences. She'd have to consider what that meant. Ignoring the world simulator rumor, this game's world was extremely large, or, rather than extremely, it might be better to say it was unsettlingly expansive. If the publicly revealed specifications were accurate, the surface area of the game world was twice as large as Earth's. They apparently employed random map generating algorithm and spent many years running calculations and building map and object data. But would that really be enough time to complete this realistic of a field twice the size of the planet for players to run around in? Not only that, putting the size of the area aside, even if the various races were set to coexist without any problems, how many AIs would it take to realize such a thing? Even if the number of digital creatures equipped with AIs on the level of intelligent life had a lower population density than that of the humans on Earth, if they had to compete with stronger creatures for territory, with the amount of land in this world being twice that of Earth, they would need at the very least a few billion individual high-spec AIs. That would be all the races of humanity the monster races, and whatever else included. Who the hell could program these memories for all those AIs, and to then scatter those AIs across a world twice the size of Earth? There can't be any inconsistencies in any of their stories. How was this even possible? Beyond all that, a few years before the servers went up, there was another rumor that the world simulator ran on accelerated time, a thousand times faster than real time, something even more unbelievable. But now, it really had to be true, this game was another world simulator. That said, Rare wasn't well versed in technology, so she wasn't suited for unraveling these kinds of mysteries. In the end, these were just the ramblings of an amateur dancing to the influence of hearsay. What Rare didn't know was whether those tasks were possible to complete in seconds with AI, for example, by developing a specialized AI that can develop another AI. Maybe there was actually technology that would allow for a super efficient and surprisingly simple solution to those issues she speculated about. She sighed again and decided to just stop thinking about that stuff, instead telling herself to start thinking about the bandits who were right in front of her, these little girls. They were all pretty shabby, their hair had grown out untended. The fur on their ears and tails had become all clumped and knotted and felt unpleasant to touch. The four of them appeared to have the same color fur at first glance, but in truth they were just all so dirty that it was hard to tell what color it should be. They were all young girls, and considering how few of them there were, they could be mistaken as just naughty thieves or burglars, 
but they were actually serious bandits who were ready to kill. Kerry and Riley, the older two, were about the same height as Rare, a little under 160 centimeters, and seemed healthy enough, but the younger two, who should be close in age, were clearly much smaller. They must not have gotten enough nutrition in their childhood. Their lives and circumstances were pitiful, and it's not like she didn't feel sorry for them. But the fact that they didn't hesitate to take lives in order to defend themselves and survive with everything they had endeared them to rear. In both the real world and in this world, their way of life branded them as felons. However, they didn't seem to have a price on their heads. They moved their bodies well, and they seemed to have a talent for knowing when to run. She had confirmed that they were bandits now, but it felt like a waste to simply turn them into XP. Was there a gameplay system for NPCs to permanently follow you? I see. Thank you for telling me about your histories. You've all done your best. However, today you were forced to submit to me. If you continue doing things the way you have been, one day someone will take everything away from you. Do you understand that? The four girls all looked shocked after hearing Rare's evaluation. Apparently they had never thought about it before. Maybe it was best not to expect too much. In order to survive, you've all needed to commit various crimes, but you need to be more discreet. And by discreet, I don't mean you should avoid people altogether, but rather you need to become someone that people don't think of as special when they remember you. You only go to town to buy clothes and food, so to the townsfolk, they wonder, how do you normally live your lives? Where did you get your money? You probably got that money from killing other criminals or traveling merchants, but as soon as they know that for sure, you'll have bounties on your heads before you know it. Well, actually, killing other criminals probably isn't a problem. But wait, when we go to town, we don't have a place to sleep, and there aren't any other people like us, so we got to steal money. Ugh. I gotta start from there, huh? Rare began by teaching them how money was earned legitimately. She had to explain how a monetary economy worked, what economic activity was, how society was structured, how the six countries came into being. This history could be found on the official game website, so she just parroted that back to them, and other basic information. It got to be too much seeing them all bound on the floor. So at some point she freed them and they put their clothes back on. Rare let them ask whatever questions they wanted, so by the time the lecture was over, around five hours had passed. She had originally planned to blast off right out of the gate and kind of sped through character creation, but now that proved to have been a pointless endeavor. However, considering how she was able to forge a connection with these NPCs instead, Maybe it didn't turn out so bad. Although she had yet to find out how useful these NPC girls would be. With these thoughts occupying her mind, she glanced over at the girls. They were all staring at her with sparkles in their eyes. She didn't know if the passionate gazes came from respect or affection, though. Miss Rare the Elf knows a lot. We've never met someone like her. And she's nice. And she's really strong. And really nice. Kerry and Riley were falling over themselves to compliment her with twinkling eyes. The younger pair were also nodding their heads in agreement. Nah, I'm not really that nice you know. I just enjoy explaining things to people. So really, I'm just doing whatever I want here. Yeah, but no one's ever politely explained all this stuff to us before. Even back at the village, when we asked about something we didn't understand, they just said don't ask about stupid stuff and hit us. That sounds pretty harsh. That said, villages tend to have a mentality of population equals labor, so maybe that's just how things were. If they were to spend their whole lives in that village, then they didn't need to know about monetary economies or the founding of the nations. The villagers might have reacted that way simply because they didn't know the answer to the girls' questions. She herself might have reacted like these girls did now sometime in her past. See. You really are nice, Kerry said, looking straight at Rare. Then the reverence faded from her eyes, replaced by uneasiness. Miss Rare the Elf, I have a request. I want you to become our leader. The required skill has not been learned. In order to tame, Kerry, you must learn their, subordinate, skill. Well that's an interesting error message. CH6. Huh? What? Tame? I can tame her? An NPC? The fact that it appeared she could tame a human NPC was of course shocking. But more importantly, there had never been any whispers of a taming system at all before. It wasn't available in the closed beta. Maybe she just never found out about it. But whatever the case, Rare was currently completely clueless. She had no idea what kind of system it was. But based on the error message she received, 
something happened that caused a tame action to activate. Normally, you'd think it came about due to Carrie's request. I want you to become our leader. In other words, from a gameplay perspective, a rare wants to tame expression of intent, or so she believed. However, because Rare didn't have a skill related to taming, the accept, decline part of the process was stymied, which prompted an error message. During the closed beta, she tried all sorts of builds in the character creator, using different combinations of skills and improving her character to see more skill trees. She discovered countless skills and the conditions for unlocking their skill trees. In order to try out that many builds, she had to re-roll countless times, which meant she restarted the game that many times. During all that testing, she had never found any skills related to taming. This probably meant that either they didn't exist during the closed beta, or their prerequisites couldn't be met with only the starting 100 XP. If it were a new system that didn't exist during the closed beta, then if people re-rolled now, there was a possibility they'd already be able to learn these skills. However, you couldn't skip the tutorial anymore. In order to test by re-rolling, you'd need to invest a huge amount of time, including the one-hour tutorial and the amount of time it took to actually create the character. If she wanted to try five different builds, it would require as much time as she'd spent in the game so far. Not to mention that she didn't know if she could find the skill in just five re-rolls. The other possibility was that taming had always existed, but that 100 XP was insufficient to meet the minimum requirements to unlock it. It was also hard to imagine any other players discovering this skill at this point in the game's life. After finishing the tutorial, they'd have to go earn more XP and they'd be looking for a taming related skill that they don't even know the prerequisites for. There probably weren't any players who would waste time farming XP for no concrete reason. In either case, that meant there probably weren't any players out there who had information on taming related skills. If there were, there wouldn't be many of them, Rare herself being one. Rare was beginning to feel pretty excited about this situation. In particular, she was stealing a march on other players and getting a leg up in the struggle for information. She wasn't planning on hoarding information, but being the only one who had this piece of info was terribly alluring. Without needing to consult with anyone anywhere about this situation, she could meticulously conduct investigations all by herself. It was also possible that, like her, someone could somehow meet the conditions and receive this error message, but considering how she got here, it was hard to imagine the stars aligning for another person. I guess. We're no good, huh? Kerry muttered sadly. Oh crap. I ignored the all-important taming target. That's not it at all. I don't believe I have any qualms with becoming your leader. In fact, I should be the one asking you. It's just that. Right, I need to consider some things first. My apologies, but please make yourselves more comfortable. What about your meal? It slipped my mind, but you were in the middle of eating weren't you? At Rare's suggestion, the four girls relaxed, allowing the tension to drain, and went about warming up their food at the campfire. Rare fell into thought, considering the implications of the, subordinate, skill that the error message mentioned in relation to taming. The most likely possibility was there, discipline, skill tree. And PCs that had been, disciplined, could be, subordinated, that sounded logical. However, during the closed beta, their, discipline, skill tree contained only, discipline, and nothing else. Plus, the active skill, discipline, was described as when successful, allows you to command the target for a fixed period of time. For example, while battling monsters, the skill was used to turn one monster hostile to all other monsters. This didn't seem to match the idea of taming. It was just a kind of quirky crowd control skill. Along the same lines, another possibility was there, mental magic skill, confuse. You couldn't control the target, but confused enemies would simply begin attacking the nearest target, so the end result was something similar. It was also very cheap to activate. Speaking of, mental magic, those skills were much more expensive to acquire than, discipline, but, charm, and, fear, both had very high success rates. When used in conjunction with their prerequisite skill, stupefy, the success rate increased even further. In addition, when using their, control, skill on targets afflicted by, charm, or, fear, could the key maybe be, mental magic? It wasn't the most ludicrous idea. Control, resonated conceptually. However, going down there, mental magic, tree to get, control, 
cost at the very least 150 XP. It was absolutely impossible to get there with the starting XP. It was still worth noting, control, as a possibility on the list, though. Testers weren't allowed to share information about the closed beta publicly. Instead, perhaps to avoid building up too much frustration, there was a closed beta social networking site where the beta testers could chat about the game all they wanted. Since no one was allowed to talk about the beta anywhere else, it got a lot of activity. Groups of volunteers shared the results of their data collection, and those results inspired both new investigations and more players to help out, resulting in a positive feedback loop. Thanks to those volunteers investigating as much as they could during the limited closed beta period, they found a ton of new skills by trying various combinations that wouldn't normally be explored. She wouldn't have enough XP to get control, but she could get as far as charm and fear, and still have enough for discipline. Just by the name, Control, one would think it'd be overpowered, but she didn't think any testers had tried it out, or at least, Rare couldn't think of anyone who had. That being the case, either learning, Control, was necessary, or it was a red herring. Considering what exact in-game conditions she'd need to fulfill, the first was obviously being connected to the right NPC, if she learned some useful skills that turned out to be unrelated. She could just go earn more XP and try again. The Katkin girls had sophisticated AIs, so even if Rare were unable to tame them, she could still cooperate with them. She was going to be their leader, after all. Which means she should just consider the information she had on hand and determine the plan that had the highest chance of success. She could set aside, mental magic, as the first possibility and consider alternatives. When thinking of the word tame, the meaning was a bit off. But there was also there, summon, skill. Just like with, discipline, there, summon, skill tree didn't have anything but, summon. This skill let you summon a random monster to your side and command it. Unless the summoned monster died, it would return to wherever it came from either after the time limit of 10 minutes or when the summoner perished. While looking through the help documentation for details on obtainable skills, Rare had learned that the summoned monster could choose whether or not to respond to the summon. If it refused, the summon would attempt to resist. If it succeeded, their summon would misfire and end immediately. Since the type of monster summoned was random, the chance of it resisting a summons would vary based on its overall stats. In other words, summoner's fatal design flaw as a skill was that its success rate varied too much. Testers all considered it a trash skill. In the first place, why was it designed to only summon something at random? By the way, speaking of, discipline, it was hard to suss out the reason for designing something as inefficient as a skill tree with only one skill in it. Another tree with only one skill was, alchemy. After learning their, pharmacy, trees, pharmacy, skill, the alchemy tree gained a skill to craft magic potions, formulate. However, their, alchemy, skill itself seemed to have a totally pointless effect required to use alchemy tree skills. Alchemy tree skill effects gain a bonus, which led to the conclusion that there must be hidden skills in the tree. If that could be extrapolated to, discipline, and, summon, then the follow-up question was how to unlock them. For now, she could hypothesize that, discipline, and, summon, had hidden depths and designate them as the second possibility. Next, she would consider not the idea of taming, but instead the idea of subordinating. Rare thought that, out of the initially available skills, the one that came closest to the concept in her head was, necromancy. The common perception of necromancers was someone who controls the souls of the dead. However, just like with the previous two trees, their, necromancy, tree only had the one skill. Its description was turns a corpse within mid-range into a controllable undead for five minutes. When the effect ends, the corpse is destroyed and returned to the earth. While it seems useful at first glance, if the soul of the corpse was still there, then, just like, summon, it could resist the, necromancy, if there was no soul, the resulting undead was so weak that it could be felled with a single blow. A rather questionable skill. She was just now realizing this, but lining up all the most likely skill trees, it seemed way too conspicuous for them to all be weird one-shot skills. Or maybe that was just her wishful thinking wanting there to be a reason behind it. Glancing around the cavern, it seemed like the girls were about done eating. They periodically came to offer her food, but she wasn't hungry. 
or more like this wasn't the time for her to be eating, so she always politely declined. Either way, time was about up. She needed to wrap things up and come to a decision, then just start taking action. CH7 After all that brainstorming, Rare had come up with three major possibilities. She had no basis for any of this, and her plan was starting to seem more and more desperate, but at least she had come up with something. Based on her calculations, she did have enough XP to start testing things out. However, once she committed her XP into any single investigation, Rare wouldn't be able to earn any more XP here. To earn back the XP she used, she'd have to go somewhere else to defeat stronger enemies. But if she only picked up weird skills, the chances of her being able to beat enemies of an appropriate difficulty would be, frankly, low. No matter how prepared she was, it wouldn't be enough to mitigate all the risk. Setting aside the most expensive tree, mental magic, she would first try, discipline, summon, and, necromancy. It cost 60 XP to unlock those three skills. After that, she double-checked each of their skill trees, but the list of unlockable skills hadn't changed at all. Well, that wasn't exactly outside expectations. No need to panic yet. If the prerequisites could be met with just these skills, then someone should have figured it out by now. Which meant the next one to try was, mental magic. In order to unlock up to, control, first, stupefy, required 10 XP, then, charm, and, fear, were 40 XP each, and finally, control, itself cost 60 XP so she needed a total of 150 XP. Thinking it over again, if this plan was a complete bust, in order to earn more XP with all her trash skills, she would at least have a decent, mental magic, spec to use. Mental magic, wanted MND, so if she dumped all her leftover XP into it, then she could at least fight competently. Boosting MND would also increase her MP pool for using all these skills so that was a convenient silver lining. With that decided, there was no more reason to hesitate. Rare used 150 XP to grab all their, mental magic, skills up to and including, control. If her hypothesis was correct, she should have unlocked additional skills. All right then, I'll start checking from, discipline. There, discipline, skill tree didn't have any new skills. There, summon, skill tree also didn't have anything new. There, necromancy, skill tree, had a new skill, bind soul, yes, got it, I was right, excited, she didn't hesitate to spend the XP, her new skill, bind soul, read, steal the soul of a corpse that died within the last hour, when using, necromancy, on a corpse that still has a soul, there, necromancy, target cannot resist, if you have a soul in stock, you can spend it to make, mental magic, control, usable on, undead, homunculus, and, golem, targets, this is amazing, dot I think, maybe, at first glance, there, steal the soul of a corpse, part felt too vague, its effects and usage weren't intuitive, it basically felt like flavor text, however, to learn this skill, you'd have to have at least, necromancy, and, control, and each of those skills had significant downsides in the forms of low success rate and can only be used on living targets, this new skill eased those limits, giving it immediate value. The soul stock must refer to the souls stolen using, bind soul. However, the skill cost 60 XP, and setting aside the cost of all the prerequisites for a moment, it was the same cost as, control. When aiming specifically for this skill, everything up to and including, control, and, necromancy, required 170 XP making it impossible to reach with just the starting XP from character creation. It was easy to re-roll during the closed beta, but innate characteristics didn't exist then, so right now there shouldn't be very many players who have discovered this skill. Even if they did know about it, not many would immediately take it and build around it. So it was probably unlikely that anyone knew about the existence of, Bind Soul. Furthermore, Bind Soul only worked on corpses that had died within the last hour. Considering this along with, necromancy's fine text, you could extrapolate that the souls in this world only remained attached to their corpses for an hour. Surprisingly, no one had verified, necromancy's if the soul was still attached to the corpse condition in the closed beta, everyone assumed it was just lore or because the corpse degraded too much after an hour or something. Anyway, she now had a skill that passively improved both, control, 
and, necromancy, she had spent two-thirds of the XP she had earned, so she hoped she could make do with what she had gotten. She still worried that she stood no chance against field or dungeon bosses, though, since they had unnaturally high resistances, well, this build isn't like, a super specialized meat cleaver that can literally only be used to cut meat. I do still have other options. Rare relaxed a bit. She had avoided the worst possible outcome where there was no possible path forward, so now she felt pretty blasé about it all. She decided to recheck. Discipline. Nope. Nothing changed at all. The skill tree still only contained, discipline, and nothing else, which made it a pretty lame tree. With these idle thoughts floating through her mind, she opened there summon, skill tree. She had unlocked a new skill, contract. She half reached out to buy it just on impulse. Its description was, forge a contract with the soul of a successfully summoned target. You may now choose to summon a contracted target when using, summon. Undead created with, necromancy, bind soul, can be added to the contract list, just like with, bind soul, and, necromancy, it was a pure upgrade to the base, summon, skill. Furthermore, it improved, bind soul, one of its prerequisites. This was really powerful. It had cost at least 310 XP in order to get all these skills. Right now, it was fair to say that Rare's three pillars of combat were, mental magic, necromancy, and, summon. It was an expensive journey, but it was well worth it. All of her earlier postulating was being proven correct. Rare now had no doubt that a new skill would appear on their, discipline, tree. And just as she hoped, there, discipline, skill tree did in fact now have a new skill. She had finally unlocked, subordinate, ch8, rare was over the moon. She did it. At this moment in time, she was the only player in the game to discover their, subordinate, skill. In order to get it, you needed a whopping 390 xp, nearly four times the starting xp. No sane player would use all that xp on crap like, summon, and, discipline. And she only realized it after the fact, but the skills that she learned all happened to be only the exact ones that she needed. Discipline, summon, and, necromancy, were all prerequisites, but getting, mental magic, first was truly the hand of fate. Or wait, conversely, if she had gotten the three trash skills first, once she got, control, she would still have discovered the same skills anyway. She was lucky. She really felt like she had used up all the fortune she'd ever have just now. But well, she did spend a lot of time thinking about it. This wasn't only due to luck, it was also a result of her own resourcefulness. Rare's adventure was only just biggie. Ak, right as she thought that, she remembered that she hadn't actually learned, subordinate, yet. Talk about putting the cart before the horse. After buying it, next was to check its effects. Tame the target, making them your follower. If the target successfully resists, subordinate, fails. Souls contracted via, summon, contract, cannot resist. Undead created via, necromancy, bind soul, cannot resist. Targets under the influence of, mental magic, control, have reduced resistance to subordinate. Experience is shared with all followers. You may now choose to summon a follower when using, summon. If a follower dies, they cannot be summoned for one hour. Truly an ultimate skill that incorporated all the previous skills required to unlock it, with perfect timing. Just as she finished verifying the skill details, she received a notification for a system message. Deferred action will now resume. Kerry, can be tamed. Apparently, Kerry's request earlier had been paused. If the required skills and conditions were not met, then stuff could be deferred. It would probably be silly to assume that the deferment would last indefinitely, though, there was probably a time limit. But it seemed like the system waited throughout their preparing meals and cleaning up and whatnot. She could tame Kerry now. She apparently didn't even need to use the skill, maybe when the target actively wanted to be tamed, there was no need to cast, subordinate since they wouldn't resist. As soon as the tame went through, Kerry's head shot up and she looked at me. I apologize, that took a long time. I believe you already understand, but you just now became my follower. I have become your leader, in more than just name. Yes, boss. Thank you so much. She checked, and Kerry's stats and skills could now be viewed in the same way she could view her own. Kerry's XP had dropped to zero, 
but that made sense since it was now shared with Rares. The reason why Rares XP had increased was probably because all of Kerry's unused XP had been consolidated with Rares when the tame occurred. Kerry's build was focused on melee combat and this was reflected in both her available skills and how much XP had been used to raise her stats, or rather, more XP had been spent on just her stats than all the XP Rare had earned. If there had been an actual fight, it would have been impossible for someone who had just finished creating their character to have ever won. I've never felt anything like this before. I can sense the boss, and I just feel so safe. She looked like she had just snuffed some catnip. Well, she'll get used to it or so Rare had no choice but to believe. The other three girls looked at her enviously. She urged them to quickly declare their loyalty as well, and they did so right away and all became tamed. Immediately after that, named enemy, Mountain Cat Bandit Group, has been defeated. Unlocked personal area, Mountain Cat Bandit Group's hideout. Register, Mountain Cat Bandit Group's hideout, as primary home. There's a housing system. That wasn't the first thing she should have reacted to. Carrie's group had apparently been some kind of unique boss. In other words, Rare had spawned right next to that unique boss. It was true that the recommended starting areas for the monster races were caves, volcanoes, or ruins, and it wouldn't be weird for such an area to include an early boss, but it was a bit unreasonable to spawn literally on top of a boss. She was beginning to feel that the monster races starting areas were unusually difficult. Choosing a monster race did result in getting extra XP, after all, or actually, since Rare was unlucky enough to spawn near a boss, if she hadn't gotten so much XP right off the bat, she might have been royally screwed. The weakest race, Goblin, starts with 220 XP, and copying Rare's choices, they'd barely be unable to get, Bind Soul. If they went straight for, Control, then dumped the rest of their XP into MND, factoring in a goblin's base stats, it was hard to imagine, control, working on an opponent like Kerry. Rare had tried to maximize her new character's potential by going for a super economical build, she attempted to offset her weaknesses by starting in monster territory, was extra careful due to starting in monster territory, because of that somehow beat a boss by catching it off guard, purposely chose not to finish them off, by some strange coincidence learned about the ability to tame and just barely had enough XP to tame that boss. If anything had gone wrong in this long chain of events, things wouldn't have turned out this way. This all had to have been planned by some higher being. In that case, no need to look a gift horse in the mouth. This place was fine to use as a home, even though it was a gloomy cave. Actually, for a nearsighted albino like her, it was actually a perfect fit. Indeed, praise be to the gods. There was a housing menu for designating a place as your home. While verifying all the details, it appeared that even the underground lake was included as part of this home. She had thought this was an unnaturally large location, but actually the path was extremely tight, wasn't it? Anyway, a new chapter in the legend of the Mountain Cat Bandit group was about to, uh, huh? By the by, you named yourselves the Mountain Cats? No, aren't we Cat Beastkin? not mountain cats. That's not what I meant. Question mark. Looks like they didn't give themselves that name. Then where exactly did this, mountain cat bandit group, name come from? She should keep this discrepancy in the back of her mind. The girls themselves may not have realized it, but it was possible one of the towns had put out a bounty on their, mountain cat bandit group. In any case, the fact that these girls were considered a unique boss cleared up a number of questions that Rare had including why she had earned so much XP from them, why they were so much stronger than she expected after becoming her followers, and finally why she had gotten so much XP just now. The explanation for the last was that it was a reward for successfully taming a boss. Ren now had 320 XP. She didn't want to increase any physical stats like STR or VIT, so her options were to boost other stats, learn new skills or spend them on strengthening the Cat Queen girls. Even if she were to use it on the girls, she still wanted to know how earning experience with followers worked. Also, while she wouldn't test it proactively, she also wanted to find out whether followers got the death penalty when they died. In any case, even if she used all 320 XP to buff herself up, Carrie would still be stronger than her. Since her build synergized so much with MND right now, She'd throw 200 XP into MND, then use another 40 XP to learn their mental magic skills. 
confuse, and sleep. She reasoned that this was technically a boss encounter, so this was her reward. Now then, this home base needed to become more home-like, because the avatar goes to sleep when the player logs out, it would be nice to log out in comfort, so a place to sleep was necessary. She wouldn't demand a bed, but she did at least want something to offset the cold, hard ground. If she had to, she could just bear with it, but she shouldn't neglect furnishing this place properly. If that could be arranged now, then she could test logging out right away. She needed to know what happened to her followers while she wasn't online. It had been nearly eight hours since she had initially logged in, but she didn't really have any plans in the real world, so she didn't mind pulling an all that nighter. Either way, her body here would be sleeping. Although for her testing, she'd be logging out then back in immediately. As far as a makeshift bed went, animal fur or monster fur would be fine. She didn't know what things lived outside the cave but there must be some kind of furry animal. Maybe one lived in the forest. CH9 Rare wanted to leave the cave with the girls and explore. But first, the four of them were filthy, so everyone went down to the underground lake to wash up. They only had plain water, so there was no way to get really clean down to the cuticles, but they could at least wash off most of the dirt. They were so dirty that the color of their washed hair barely changed compared to before, but after some patient, spirited scrubbing, it was at least evident under torchlight that they had each different colored hair. Kerry's hair was probably a bright reddish brown, maybe like a copper red. In a well-lit area, it would surely shine brilliantly, though Rare couldn't say if she'd ever get the chance to see it. Riley's hair was sepia colored, something close to an olive brown. In the cave, it was the least eye-catching color. Rumi had the brightest colored hair. Yellow ochre might not be the most flattering image, but once her cuticles were healed, it might be a nice, deep blonde. Marion's hair took the most work to clean. It felt like she could scrub forever and dirt would continue to slough off, but it was also apparently just a brown color. It was much darker than Riley's. She wanted to find some kind of hair cleaning oil or chemical to get them even cleaner, but for now, this was all she could do. Scissors would be nice too, so she could cut it, try to untangle it a bit, and generally just tidy them up but she'd just have to settle for this kind of wild, disheveled look for the time being. They may be leaving, but since the cave was now her personal area, only Rare and her followers were allowed to enter it. No need to leave someone at home. This meant that the cave could no longer be randomly chosen as a starting location for a new player. Rare certainly hadn't intended to completely take over one of the monster race's random spawn points, but then again, considering the size of the continent, there must be countless caves like this out there, so even if the number of spawn points went down by one, it's not like suddenly new players couldn't start a new game or anything. It was dark outside the cave, enough that it was hard to see anything right in front of you. It must be way past sundown, something rare welcomed. She didn't have to worry about sunburn, and either way she wouldn't be able to see too far in front of her anyway. It appeared that the moon was out, but the dense trees completely covered the sky so no moonlight could get through. She could hear the high-pitched cries of some faraway animal. There must be a lot of nocturnal beasts. Kerry, are you familiar with this forest? Nah, we haven't been in this area that long, so I don't know much. We only just found that cave earlier this morning. Now that she mentioned it, Rare felt like she had already been told that. Even though they just got here, it had already become their mountain cat bandit group space. Perhaps it was a seed planted for future development. The base designation and becoming a unique boss, that is. Boss, where were you hiding in the cave? When we found it, we searched the whole thing, so there shouldn't have been any monsters or anything in there. Ugh, I actually don't know myself. I don't know how I ended up all the way in the back of the cave. And then you girls. A bunch of armed strangers found me, so I just ended up attacking you, Zatso. I guess weird stuff happens sometimes. Maybe it was because we were bound together as master and follower, but she was damn gullible. Or maybe she was just an idiot since her eye ante was low, she just blurted out whatever was on her mind. If that really were the cause, even though she was a melee DPS, she still needed a certain amount of INT. Rare could boost it, but her current store of XP was too low. In any case, the five of them needed to farm XP. Their current objectives were furs, food, and XP. In other words, they needed to find something furry and edible to beat up. After explaining that, Marion crouched down and began sniffing. She had their, enhanced smell, skill, 
which she must have activated. Boss, I smell a wild boar. Rare indicated that Marion should follow the scent, and Remy focused on listening to their surroundings. Remy had the enhanced hearing skill. With Marion at the front and Rare in the center, the group of five slowly and carefully traversed the forest. Having lots of experience walking through woods from other games, Rare skillfully avoided all the roots and leaves on the ground. Marion and Riley in front cleared all the hanging vines and impeding underbrush with their hatchets. Dot stop, Remy said to hold back the group. Dot I hear fighting. Another beast. Marion also spoke up. I can also smell blood. Probably a boar and a wolf. Riley, go up and sneak a peek. Kerry directed. K. Riley went to go scout alone. She had both there enhanced vision, and, Hawkeye, skills, Hawkeye, was in there, archery, tree and gave a bonus to accuracy when shooting at long range, but it also had a secondary effect of making it easier to spot objects beyond long range, if you couldn't see it, you couldn't target it, after all, ah, sorry boss, for giving orders, it's just a habit, not at all, I don't mind, rather, when we're in a small group like this, or when an immediate decision is necessary, just get my permission after. Actually, we've been talking normally. Is it all right not to hold our breaths or something? Yeah, it's fine. Boar and wolves both have noses better than ours, so they'd know about us way before we know about them. Ah, gotcha. In other words, it's hard to ambush wild animals in the forest. Obvious fact is obvious. But if a beast can, who already had enhanced senses, strengthened their sense of smell with skills and was still outperformed by a wild wolf, she wondered how normal players were supposed to hunt wolves. Rare, who hadn't explored the forests much during the closed beta, had no idea. After a bit of time, Riley returned. Since everyone's range of vision was so severely handicapped, it almost looked like she had just suddenly popped into existence. Just like Marion said, it's a wolf. It probably attacked the boar we were tracking. Got it, boss. What should we do? Apparently Kerry decided her role was to handle minor orders then check with her boss, Rare, for feedback and direction. They had a surprisingly competent command structure. Or something that felt kind of close to how a wild pack of beasts operated. We'll be opportunists, wait for the boar to go down, then attack the wolf. Although we actually want the boar to still be alive then take them both out. XP is precious. Got it. Let's move, girls. As soon as Kerry said that, she immediately turned to Rhea. R, boss, so I'd right if we go? Of course. If that's what you've decided, Kerry, then don't mind me. Just bring me their heads. With a ferocious smile, she melted into the darkness. The other three followed after her. Rhea listened for the sounds of battle to make her way to where she thought it was taking place. CH10. There was a clearing in the forest that was slightly illuminated, where the sounds of combat were clear. Hidden in the shadows of the trees. Rare observed the battle. There, a three-way confrontation between the wild boar, the wolf, and the mountain cats unfolded. Holy shit, they're huge. The hell kind of boar and wolf are they? They've gotta be goddamn monsters, not just wild animals. The wolf was a little bit taller than Kerry. Eyeballing, it was probably over two meters long. The boar was even bigger than that. It had to have been at least three meters tall. The clearing had been smaller, but the two rampaging monsters kept knocking down trees so it ended up turning into a large, open area. Apparently the wolf had been attacking the boar's legs, since the boar seemed to be shaking on its feet. Kerry was keeping the wolf at bay while also aiming for the boar's legs with her sword. A boar the size of a large car was charging around and she hung around slashing at it like it was nothing. Rare couldn't possibly imagine herself succeeding in the same position. Kerry's, quick-wittedness, and, acrobatics, skills were putting in some work. Finally. The boar heaved forward and collapsed on the ground. An arrow suddenly came flying in out of nowhere, piercing right through one of its eyes. The boar let out a screech, arching its back up and swinging its head round. At the end of one swing, its head stopped for a split second before it was going to be swung back the other way, zeroing in on that instant, another arrow sunk into its other eye. Must be Remy and Riley, they both had their, archery, skill. Because it was so huge, though. The arrows that had speared both of its eyes didn't appear to reach its brain, so the boar still struggled. However, neither the wolf nor the girls paid it any more attention. My hands are all sweaty just from watching this play out, but it's not like they told me not to get in the way or anything. This was the perfect chance to test her skills and stats. Alright, 
First is, stupefy. She felt something pushing back for a moment, but that feeling crumbled away and the wolf stopped moving. Its eyes wavered, unfocused. It was now afflicted by the stupefy status debuff. Boss, did you just do something? Yeah. Kerry, don't attack. Continuing on, charm. Stupefy, only debilitated a target for a few seconds. In that time, you needed to follow up with either, charm, or fear. This time she didn't feel any resistance at all. Targets afflicted by stupefy had decreased resistance to, charm, and, fear, after all. The wolf's eyes half closed, and it lowered its head and padded toward Rhea. That was most likely what, charm s caster, Rhea, wanted. Looks like it worked. Next is, control. There was a little bit of resistance as the wolf walked up to Rhea and hung its head down. Now for the finisher. Subordinate. The wolf lay down on the ground then rolled over to show its stomach. It barely resisted at all. Success. Even against highly hostile enemies, I can still easily subordinate them. As far as she could tell from watching Kerry and the girls fight, the wolf was stronger than they were. They could easily defeat it as a team, but one on one, they would have to run. Part of the reason it was so easy to use, subordinate, could be because Rare used it in the middle of a fight, while it was distracted. But the biggest factor was simply her enormous M and D stat. Since her overall stats were so much lower compared to Carrie and the girls, she probably should have used her XP to help close the gap, but instead she put way too much into M and D. Thinking about it objectively, she had casually spent 200 XP, but that was twice the amount that a starting player received. No sane player would ignore skills and waste 200 XP on just M and D. While Carrie was above rare in terms of overall strength. Rare's MND was three times higher than Kerry's. Monsters that were only a little stronger than Kerry shouldn't have enough MND to resist. Or like, the girls are a composite four-person unique boss, and the wolf and boar were only a bit weaker. For early game enemies, they're pretty damn strong. What the hell's with this forest? Rare was starting to wonder where exactly she had started out. She had no regrets at this point, but she was starting to feel kind of bad for the innocent skeleton players who started out in similar places as this. In any case, that was a good hunt. Let's bring this boar back, boss. It'd be better to butcher it here. If we don't drain the blood right after it dies, the meat'll go bad. Aha, you're right. Go ahead, then. Remy and Riley will monitor the area. Ah, actually, hold on. She could put their new comrade to work instead. Hey, you, you're mine now. Do you understand? We're gonna make this boar easier to eat, so while we do that, I want you to make sure no other beasts come near us, she said. While mussing up the fur on the wolf's stomach, after hearing its orders, the wolf immediately got up and began circling the edge of the clearing, its nose and ears twitching occasionally. As soon as it was tamed, the girls immediately recognized the wolf as their ally, so they completely trusted it to watch their backs. Rare. Having nothing else to do decided to check out the wolf's status. It had a number of skills she had never seen before. They must be ones with special conditions to unlock. These were skills that seemed possible for the girls to learn, but looking at their skill trees, none of them were available. They were apparently skills with unlock conditions outside of having the right combination of skills. She was glad that, subordinate, wasn't like that. The wolf also had innate characteristics like, keen smell, and, keen hearing. Monsters and wild beasts get to use their innate characteristics as soon as they're born, it seemed. On second thought, for wolves to be unable to use their noses until they learned a skill was kind of silly. These types of innate characteristics must only be available to certain races. The wolf was an ice wolf. Yep, it really was a monster. For an ice wolf, though, its belly had been quite warm when she had rubbed it. The spot for its name was blank. She should probably name it. The butchering was almost done, though, so she could come up with one after they'd gotten back to base and settled in. Boss, we're done. For now, we wrapped up the meat in the fur, we don't want the entrails so we'll bury them. But what about the bones? It'd help if the wolf could carry the meat, but adding the bones would be too heavy. It's fine, I can take it all. Here. After saying so, Rare put everything in her inventory. The meat, the fur, the bones, and also the entrails. Boss. The meat's all gone. Did you do that? Yes, I did. It's called an inventory. It's a way to hide things in a secret place. Wow. How do you do that? How? Well, it's like, there's an invisible bag I can use to store things. If I want to put something away, 
I cover it with this big bag, then I just close it. Something like that. Since the system just did it for her, it was extremely difficult to explain how an inventory worked. Only players could use it anyway, so even if she could explain it properly, they wouldn't be able to use it anyway. I don't really get it. It's fine, I can explain it again later. Anyway, we've accomplished our goal, so let's return to the cave. Vaguely hand waving the topic away, Rare stood up and made to start heading back. The wolf, who had been keeping watch, came up to her and pushed its nose into her stomach. Huh? What's wrong? Dot family, you weren't just a lone wolf. Apparently, the wolf had family. CH11. A lone wolf might sound cool. But generally they were actually just wolves who had lost a power struggle in a pack. Rare's group hadn't encountered any other wolves of this type, but thinking back, this wolf didn't seem weak enough to be kicked out of a pack. While it had faced off against the girls and the boar, it hadn't felt at all in disgrace. Although now that it was Rare's follower, it was hard not to see it as just a big house dog. But that's fine. If you've got family, we might as well take them all in. I'm not heartless enough to force you apart. After all, at this point in time, Rare wasn't concerned with the demerits of having more, subordinated, followers. She'd need increasing amounts of XP to support them all, but she came to a realization from seeing the Katkin girls fight, it would drastically reduce the risk whenever they went into battle. Speaking of that last battle, the XP she got from incapacitating a wolf that was about the same or slightly higher in power level was probably about the same as she'd get from defeating an equal enemy solo. Having to split that XP in 5 was obviously a big decrease. But it also meant the duration of battle decreasing by a corresponding amount. Even still, doing some mental math, while soloing would still be noticeably more efficient, there was still a lot of value in doing things this way where the XP earnings would be more stable. If the number of her followers increased, then she'd just have to earn that much more XP. While Rare had gotten excited and recklessly splurged when she first discovered the subordinate, system, she originally wasn't planning to proactively participate in raids or PvP, she just wanted to enjoy the game at her own leisure. She was looking forward to the game so much that she signed up for not just the open beta but also the closed beta, which is how she became a tester. Besides, there were a lot of things she wanted to try out with more followers, there were things she could investigate about the very act of getting more. If she could spec each follower however she liked. Then she could build characters who were completely different types from her. She'd have to order the NPC around instead of playing herself, but still, she could have a lot of fun researching and optimizing builds. Like, seeing if increasing Kerry's INT could elevate her from her idiot status or not. They followed the wolf deeper into the forest. They technically used an animal trail, but it wasn't hard to traverse since these animals were so huge that they could just walk the trail normally. After a short time, they arrived at a cave entrance that was similar to Rare's current home. Apparently, this was a wolf den. The wolf wanted to go into the cave alone, so she agreed to wait outside. Rare had tamed the alpha wolf, so she figured everything would be fine, but if she had gone inside with it, she couldn't discount the possibility of some disgruntled pack mates deciding to attack her. Having no idea what the state of things were in the pack, that was the one outcome she wanted to avoid. Eventually, the wolf came back out, behind it, more of what looked like the same kind of wolf followed it outside. Looks like she really had tamed the largest one, since the next one was slightly smaller, and the other six were about the size of larger breeds of dogs in the real world. Well, they were about as big as real wolves, but their anatomy, like their faces and legs, were a lot thicker. In other words, they were more like giant puppies, that's what they reminded her of. God. They are so adorable. The wolves apparently knew what happened since they all came before her and bowed their heads. Ice wolf, wolf pup, wolf pup, wolf pup, wolf pup, wolf pup, wolf pup, can be tamed. This was probably the same as what happened with the cat queen girls. There was no need to activate the skill at all. Alright, your pack will become my family starting today. I'm your pack leader. Got it? After that declaration, the wolves came closer and after rubbing their noses on her legs, all rolled over, showing their bellies. All right, good, good, good boys and girls, good, good. The wolf pup's tummies were even warmer than the alpha wolf's was. They were all so big that it took some time to get around to rubbing all their bellies, but Rare stood up satisfied. The wolves said, though not with words, they couldn't talk. After all, 
that they might be one pack, but they apparently weren't all related by blood. A pack had gotten attacked in the past, and all the wolves had scattered, somehow, these pups all ended up next to the two larger ice wolves, who protected them until they were all able to escape safely. This species of wolf normally lived further north. They are ice wolves, after all, so that makes sense. I did wonder why they were in a place like this. That said, Rare still didn't know where this area was in the first place. Based on the air temperature and humidity, she assumed that the latitude wasn't very high, but that was all she could conclude. By the way, we're planning to return to my base now. But first, do you mind if I take a peek at your den? Is there anything left in there? Sensing their permission, Rare decided to explore the cave. She had left her base in order to find some furs but it felt like little by little her objectives kept changing in the wrong direction. Even though Rare just wanted to casually enjoy the game. Well, no worries. Plus, the Alpha Wolf was able to match up about evenly with the four Cat Queen girls. Just like with Carrie's group, if all these wolves had been waiting in the cave together, they would have been a huge threat. It was possible that they together were also a composite unique boss. If this was a boss lair, then she might be able to obtain it as another home. If so, then she wanted to check the interior layout, if it was better, then she could move her home here instead. Fortunately, they hadn't left anything behind back at the other base. This cave was bigger than the other one. Rare only remembered this once she entered, but the entrance to the other cave was too narrow, so only the wolf pups could have gotten in. There had been no choice but to abandon the first base as soon as she tamed the alpha wolf. Aside from the difference in size, the layout was similar, after a short walk. A large cavern opened up, and it continued further in as well. This space was kind of gourd-shaped, there were two spherical chambers that were connected via a gentle slope in the middle, and there was a tunnel entrance high up in the rear wall. Unlike the other caves, this wasn't a Krakow fissure, it was an unnatural, round opening. It appeared large enough for something human-sized to crawl through. Wonder what that is? The wolves had said that there was nothing left inside but that probably wasn't true. She should assume there was another resident in the tunnel. It was just way too suspicious. But if she wanted to make this cave her new base, then she couldn't leave anything suspicious alone. There was no system message when she had entered the cave informing her of a new personal area, but if they got rid of the unknown resident, that might trigger it for her. Since she had absolutely no idea what defined a personal area, it was entirely possible that some other reason prevented her from making this her home. If that were the case, then she'd just have to give up and figure out a way to expand the old base. I want to investigate that hole, but what's the best way? We just got to dive in, right? We got no idea if anything's there, so if someone's gonna go, then we'll go take a look first. Valf. R. Wait, I hear something. Apparently, both the Alpha Wolf and Remy heard something. Everyone held their breath at the same time and stared up at the hole. No one moved at all, it was so still that her ears started buzzing. After some time, Rare's ears also made out a faint noise. Like a clacking or clinking of some kind, as though someone were swinging a pickaxe into the ground over and over again. That uniform sound began to get closer and closer, louder and louder, as soon as she thought it's here. Something black and shiny emerged from the hole. An ant. It's an ant. CH12. The mysterious hole was actually a tunnel leading to an ant nest. The ant part was fine, but these things were freaking huge. The situation was probably that since this was the ice wolves den, they never used the tunnels on this side. The ants probably aimed to come when only the wolf pups were supposed to be here, based on their reconnaissance, and that just happened to be right now. Depending on the size of the nest. Rare would have thought they could easily trample over eight giant wolves with pure numbers, so there must be some reason they never did that. Monster ants. Damn pain in the ass. What do we do, boss? What do we do? How should I know? Rare retorted mentally, though she was already formulating a plan in her head. Tame the ants. If they can be used as labor, then it would be easy to enlarge the cave. If these ants had the same kind of ecology as the kind she knew from real life, as soon as she tamed the queen ant they'd be victorious. In that case, they need to venture into the depths of the nest. Is there any way for us to get to the deepest part of the nest? Was what came out earlier a worker ant? If she had tamed it when it was here, then they could just tame their way through the nest. However, to do that, they need to make contact with an ant, since the one from before already left. Right now, the only way they had to access the nest was this tunnel, 
so the only option now was to take the plunge. Not only that, Rare herself had to go to. It's suicidal to charge into a place where only our movements are restricted. That said, Rare's skill set didn't contribute much in terms of direct offensive power. She was quite confident in her combat ability without relying on skills or stats, but that was still at best only useful against single, individual enemies. But when facing six-legged creatures that didn't even come up to her knees, it was hard to expect a proper one-on-one -on -one duel, in which case, whether or not Rare had freedom of movement didn't change much in terms of strategy. If it came down to it, leaning on her, mental magic, and going alone was probably the most logical option. Plus, if there's a big enough room in there, then I can, summon, my followers to me. So then the next question was, Rand's susceptible to, mental magic, or not? Would be nice if you dropped by again, Mr. Rant. Should I go catch one? Marion offered. If it was Marion, the smallest, compared to say Kerry, she should be able to move around a bit more easily, but still, no, hold on a second. Considering everyone's current fighting capability, their group was heavily skewed toward physical attacks. The ice wolves could technically use ice elemental attacks and ice magic, but right now they couldn't even fit in the tunnel so it was a moot point. Which meant that this might be a good time to consider obtaining magic as a potential countermeasure. From the looks of them, physical attacks probably wouldn't be terribly effective on ants. Even if they didn't end up fighting these ants this time, there could be enemies where that was the case in the future. She originally wanted to have more numbers in order to stabilize their battles anyway, that being the case, having more diverse tactics available was also a high priority. With the Ice Wolves joining the party, they now had a total of 200 XP. Having to manage that between 11 individuals would be a nightmare, it wasn't enough to do anything basically, but it was enough to invest all into one person. Additionally, if they just wanted to catch all your one ant, with a little more planning, it wouldn't even be necessary to spend all of it. Marion, as you offered, I'd like you to capture an ant. However, before that, I'd like to show you how to use magic. 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 Can I use magic too? Have you seen someone use magic before? My papa back at the settlement could use magic. Knowing magic meant you got to wear nice clothes and eat until you were full. A beastkin's base stats made them less suited to being mages, so a beastkin NPC that could naturally use magic was probably very rare. Depending on what element of magic they could use. They could have been a local celebrity in a mountain village. Since the girls' settlement was very close to monster territory, it was quite likely that they had a mage as part of their defenses. Is that so? I eventually intend for all of you girls to learn some kind of magical ability, so first is you, Marion. The question is what kind of magic is suitable for you? Right now, she wanted to pick something that would be effective against the ants but she wasn't sure which element that would be. Fire was the classic anti-insect element, but that only applied in reality. Not to mention it's not as though insects were especially vulnerable, most living things died to fire, really. And since most things were vulnerable to it, it meant there were countless ways to utilize it effectively. Fire might be good, but it might not be a great idea to use in an enclosed space. We don't want to burn up all the oxygen. Rare's first base had some kind of magical ventilation, but she didn't know if these tunnels had it too. On the other hand, oxygen deprivation could be a card to play. She wasn't sure how these ants were different from real ants, but considering they were insects, they should have a number of spiracles on their bodies. They still needed oxygen to function, so if the concentration of oxygen dropped, it could slow them down. However, if their caves did have magical ventilation, then it would be a wasted endeavor. Furthermore, their size was a concern. Compared to rear lands, they should need more oxygen to function. That would be a normal conclusion to reach, but since this was a game world, maybe their bodies had some magical ability that let them operate normally with low levels of oxygen. And actually, to begin with, she wasn't even sure if magically created fire consumed oxygen at all. Now she was curious and wanted to investigate, but in order to prove it one way or the other she'd need various lab equipment. It's really annoying to fight magical enemies. I guess we got a counter with magic ourselves. If fire was too hard to use, then what would the next best element be? Not that fire had been determined to be effective or anything. It was probably best to just forget about real ants for a second and go over known information. They didn't know much about these ants right now. First, 
They were about as large as typical house dogs. They were fast, but their movements didn't appear irregular in any way. Next, they were able to make a pretty clean circular hole in the wall of this cave, which was hard bedrock, so they were good at excavating. She had no proof that an ant was what created that tunnel originally, but she at least couldn't believe that it had occurred naturally. In which case, it would be better to presume it was within the capabilities of their foe. These were all the facts they had. They knew nothing that could lead to identifying a weakness. R. Boss. Maybe they're not so good with wolves, don't you think? Rhea had been mumbling to herself while thinking, so Riley offered her input. Indeed, as Kerry said, it wasn't just her, enhanced eyesight, she was sharp in many ways. Rhea had also considered the possibility but only spent a moment considering it before getting distracted. Running with the idea, what exactly did it mean to be not so good with wolves? Considering the current situation, it's not like they couldn't carry them. If it wasn't the wolves that they didn't like, then maybe instead it had to do with magic. Considering their constitution, an ant wouldn't normally be able to win in a straight-up fight. If that were the reason, it's not like she couldn't understand, but they should still be able to crush the wolves with numbers. In the real world, Ants were able to protect themselves against small animals that were tens of times their size by banding together. And the ants in this world were gigantic. The wolves were larger as well, but not to the degree that the ants were. A group of giant ants should easily be able to protect themselves. That meant that there was another factor distorting the usual relationship between ants and normal animals in this case. For example, Something unique to this world. A magical kind of factor. Ice wolves. Could this mean the ants are weak to ice? CH13. The ants must have seen the ice wolves use ice attacks while scouting or something. Ice wolves weren't monsters native to this area. They had been ousted by a competing species, and this wolf pack ended up fleeing south. If the ants were indigenous to this area, it would be difficult to suddenly have to find a way to deal with an unknown species like ice wolves. Considering the climate, there probably weren't any other monsters in this region that could use ice. Even so, the ants should still have the advantage by virtue of their overwhelming numbers, so maybe ants became weak when the temperature dropped. Well, insects in the real world were also weaker in low temperatures, but in this world, Perhaps the ants didn't have any kind of magical defenses to cope with it, or, maybe the ants were weak to ice for an entirely magical reason instead. Dot well, for now, let's just try it out and worry more later. At this point, there isn't anything left to consider. She would have marry and learn ice magic. First off was, magical affinity, ice, and, freeze. She would like to get the, ice bullet, offensive spell as well. But the effect they needed right now was the ability to lower air temperature, not the ability to kill, particularly since their current goal was to capture an ant. Regular magic attacks dealt damage based on the INT stat. Marion was a beastkin, and her INT was also extremely low, so her magic wouldn't be very potent. But even before that, she didn't have the minimum required stats, so she wasn't even eligible to learn magic yet. So first, Rare needed to spend some XP on increasing Marion's INT stat. She didn't want to run empty on XP, so she spent in moderation. Still, Marion now had as much INT as a newbie elf specializing in casting magic. Thinking of how she was already a prodigious ranger, now all she needed was offensive magic and she would probably be able to take out a player at first sight. Not that Rare had any plans at the moment to go picking. Well, Marion, now. You should understand the basics of, ice magic. Oh ooh, ooh, so cool. I do. I know how to use it too. Is this your power, boss? That's right. Aren't you glad? It wasn't technically Rare's power, but rather a function of the game system, but it was true that Rare was the primary impetus. This goes for all of you as well. If you work properly for me, then I can give you magic, power, and more. Marion, this is my down payment on you. But you'll work hard right? Yeah, I'll go freeze the ants and catch them. Good girl. We'll all wait for you here, so it's up to you. Marion dove into the nest. All that was left was to wait and see what happened. As long as they weren't too far away, Rhea vaguely knew the status of her followers. If she judged that things had gotten too dangerous, she should be able to summon Marion back here. Until Marion returned, she should think about how to spend the remaining XP strengthening everyone else. It slipped her mind while thinking about teaching her magic. But since Marion's INT went up, 
it's possible that may have affected the NPC's cognitive ability as well. From the start, the Cat Queen girl's builds were oddly unbalanced, with only INT being low, so she was thinking it would be good to increase it for all of them. She didn't exactly dislike their crude language, but if they were going to go to town in the future, it would be better if they learned how to be more polite. She wasn't sure if their ability to study would also go up with INT, but it was worth trying. If it turned out it didn't work that way, then at least it wouldn't be wasted since it still let them learn magic later. If she were to use most of the rest of the XP, it would be on raising Kerry, Riley, and Remy's INT. There wasn't enough to get them each as high as what Marion had now but she could at least get theirs up to her own base INT. Player's actual intelligence wasn't tied to the stat, so everyone having the same INT didn't annoy her or anything. That said, she only had 20 XP left, and since she might want to learn standard magic for her own use in the near future, maybe she would raise her own INT. Hers would then be higher. In and of itself, there was no ulterior reason for her to do this, but man, Marion's really was high. But now she was out of XP. Not that she felt inferior, or really cared or anything. Boss, Marion's coming back. Her ears. Having picked up on something, Remy's report interrupted Rare's mental monologue. Apparently, Marion was successful. But it sounds like an ant's coming too. I can hear its footsteps. In other words, Marion was being pursued. She might be able to get away on her own, but there was no sense in taking needless risks. Summon. Marion. The ground before air glowed, and an instant later, Marion materialized within the light. She was holding a frost-covered ant. Dot R, was that boss's magic? Thank you for helping. Before air could explain, Marion had already guessed what had happened and expressed gratitude. Whether it was due to her increased INT or she was just that kind of person, it was wonderful that no explanation was needed. Although, summon, was a skill, not magic. But that wasn't particularly important at the moment. Not at all. You appear to have completed your task. Good job. Now, you must be cold. Go ahead and just set it on the floor. The ant Marion was carrying wasn't completely frozen, nor was it dead. It was barely moving. She had maintained it in a perfectly incapacitated state. Remy, what happened to the ant that was chasing Marion? Dot I think. It's panicking around where Marion disappeared. Probably because the thing it was chasing suddenly vanished. Do you think it'll come investigate all the way here? I'm not sure. Ah, it just left. Maybe it's going back to report? Remy was also voicing her opinions now. It wasn't ideal for reports to be weighed down with prejudice or wishful thinking, but that was something she could warn them about over time. It was good that they were thinking for themselves and felt comfortable voicing their conclusions, though. If they had more XP leeway in the future, she wanted to increase the girl's INT some more. It was possible that they had been so quiet before now because they were unable to comprehend the situations at the time. Anyway, first, let's thaw out this ant. It would have been nice if I had someone learn, fire magic. But since we're out of XP, all we can do is wait for it to thaw out by itself. I'd prefer not to give the colony that much time, though. Say, boss. Yes, what is it, Kerry? You can test, subordinate on it whether it's frozen or not, right? As long as it's healthy, we got what we wanted, yeah? Holy smokes. Kerry was totally right. There was no doubt about it, this was because their INT went up. While Rare still had a higher INT stat, she had a feeling that Kerry was now smarter than her. Players' intelligence weren't tied to their stats. This was the opposite case playing out. Well, you know, it was a good thing. Having smart subordinates. Just like with Rumi earlier, though. She'd have to teach them how to clearly differentiate between observations and opinions. But if that could be cleared up, it should result in an increase to their combat potential that couldn't be quantified with stat values. I see, a magnificent observation, Kerry. It's exactly as you say. I'll try it out right away. Rare cast, stupefy, on the ant. It was hard to tell since it hadn't been moving much in the first place, but it should have been successful. Since she barely felt any resistance. She started to worry if she had actually activated it or not. Mental magic, spells went flashy and didn't leave clear visual indicators of their effects, which was pretty inconvenient. Next she'd use, fear. Normally she would follow up with, charm. But since she'd never used, fear, before, she wanted to test it out. When she had used, charm, on the ice wolf earlier, there was nearly no resistance. But right now with, fear, 
she could feel quite a bit of it. It still ended up working, though. This might mean that Ice Wolves had less charm resistance than ants had fear resistance. It was true that she had a hard time imagining insects feeling fear. Another explanation was that Rare herself was simply better at using charm than fear, but from a game system perspective, there shouldn't be any diff. Dot R, that reminds me, I did have that, beauty, trait, didn't I? The innate characteristic, beauty, had the effect, favorability with NPCs is increased, didn't it? Apparently it modified the success rate of, charm. Thinking it over, that shouldn't have been unexpected. Maybe being able to immediately tame the catkin girls after spending five hours with them was also in part due to its effects. In any case, fear, still got through. Now she just needed, control, to work and then, subordinate, should be a guaranteed, control. Good. Then, subordinate, huh? Subordinate, cannot be activated. The target, infantry ant, has already been tamed. CH-14. This one error message gave me a ton of information. First, the name of the ant. It was in, infantry ant, monster, so like a foot soldier ant. Diving deeper into the name. These ants were probably social insect monsters, so if this one was an infantry unit, then it was probably being commanded by a higher unit. And that higher unit was probably the tamer, or at least that's how she was reading it. In all likelihood, it was the queen somewhere in the nest. The follower system seemed to be structured kind of like a company or a business. There was a boss at the top who received profit from those below, in this case XP and distributed that profit back down to the entire organization. Everyone cooperated as though they were all part of one whole. This also resembled how social animals like ants and bees functioned. Maybe their, subordinate, skill was actually developed specifically for these kinds of social monsters. Just like how ice wolves had skills like, claw, and, bite, special skills that were unique to monsters race. Well, maybe players could get them if they had bare arms or something like their bodies were reconstructed with monster parts, maybe then they could learn these monsters skills too, but for the most part, they were limited to monsters. If that were the case, then even if they had the, subordinate, skill, if it really was created specifically for monsters, it's possible they wouldn't have the prerequisite, mental magic, or, summon, skills. Nah, that conclusion's way too optimistic. Maybe they didn't have them, but if they did, they'd be a real pain in the ass. The current rare could probably resist an enemy's, mental magic, since she maxed out her MND, but that wasn't the case for everyone else. Thankfully, both, control, and, fear, worked on the soldier ant, so if rare went alone, that would minimize any collateral damage. I'll be going in by myself. Control, seems to work, and even if I'd brought more people with me, only the person in front can fight anyway, rare declared. But boss, if the ants all try to attack you at once, there's no way you can, control, all of them, right? No matter how you slice it, it's too dangerous. You at least need to bring someone to guard you, Gary argued. You should at least bring me. The cold makes them slow, so that would bite time for boss to use magic, jumped in Marion. I think I should come too. My, enhanced hearing, lets me know what the ants are doing, Remy offered. The tunnels are dark, so I don't think my eyes will be very useful, but, well, it's better to have more people to shield you, right? Riley threw out hopefully. In the end, all the humans would be going. The ice wolves couldn't possibly fit in the tunnel, so they would all be staying behind, watching the entrance to the nest to make sure the ants couldn't come take over the cave. The wolf pups could probably fit, but there was no point in taking them. Ah, before we leave, I should give you guys names. Rare commented. She had put it off before. But she needed to name the ice wolves. Without names, she couldn't, summon, any specific wolves. All she could designate was ice wolf, but she wouldn't know which one would be summoned. Even though Kerry would be acting as her shield, if the tunnels opened into a larger area and the ants tried to crush them with numbers, there would be nothing they could do. If such a situation arose, being able to, summon, a nice wolf could give them a huge advantage. First is you. You'll be, Hakuma. And since you're a girl, Ginka, the kids will be, starting from you, Mizo, Ara, Hayu, Fubuki, Kogom, then, Zaram. The alpha wolf that Rare first used, subordinate, 
One was now Hakuma. The other adult ice wolf was Ginka. Hakuma refers to a catastrophic snowstorm. Ginka is a name that originated from likening snow to a flower. For the pups, Mizor and Hayu were boys while Ara, Fubuki, Kogom, and Zaram were girls. After naming the wolves, the group entered the tunnel in the order of Kerry, Ra, Marion, Rami, and finally Riley. The tunnel was cramped and dark. The five of them had to crawl on their hands and knees, so progress was slow. The ground and walls were smooth for some reason. The best guess she had for the material was limestone. But again, it was hard to imagine these round tunnels forming naturally in a limestone cavern, so something must have made them. If it were any other rock tunnel, then Rare in her starting equipment would have completely torn up her palms and knees, so she should at least express her thanks to whatever that was. Even though it was smooth, crawling on the hard ground in reality would cause the skin on her knees to become calloused, which she would be afraid to risk since it would ruin her shapely legs. If something like that actually happened, she would surely be punished by her household. There were many things that she could only experience within the worlds of VR. Without encountering any ants, the cramped tunnels finally opened up into a space where they could just barely stand and walk. While a few dozen ants could fit here comfortably, this also allowed the group to get into formation. This is where I caught the lookout ant before. On the way back, other ants probably saw the lookout was gone and came after me. I see. I wonder why there isn't a lookout or anything here now, then? After that incident, it should have been clear that there were intruders. Are they holing up in a more defensible location? If they had never been attacked from this direction before, perhaps they were overreacting. That was understandable considering the intruders were probably associated with their arch nemesis, the ice wolves. It's still pretty cramped, but looks like we don't have to crawl anymore. Let's just keep going. They formed a line in the same order as before and proceeded down the tunnel. Kerry was on guard, wielding her one-handed sword. Remy and Riley also unslung the bows from their backs. Before, Marion might have taken out some kind of weapon as well, but now she just watched her surroundings with empty hands. Maybe she could use some kind of item that helped her with magic. It might be faster to steal one from someone. They certainly didn't have the funds to buy one. They had to walk as quietly as possible so that Remy's ears could track the ants' locations. Ahead of us, I think there's lots of them. Even though there's so many, they're not moving much so maybe an ambush. Finally, there might be a battle. Rare kept her mind focused, ready to order Marion to let loose a chilling spell or to use, charm, herself in a wide net. Without leading with a single target, stupefy, the success rate would decrease, but if there were a lot of enemies, rather than guaranteeing success one target at a time, she would prefer to try lowering their overall combat strength by using a low success spell over a wide area. They came to a slightly more spacious room packed tightly with clamoring ants. There wasn't a central light source, so it vaguely appeared as though the floor was covered in a lumpy, shiny black mass. Rare wasn't particularly bad with insects, but that sight still made her feel an instinctive revulsion. However, if she considered that in some hours they would all be under her command, Maybe it would seem rather dependable instead. She should probably refrain from counting her chickens before they hatched, though. The ants should have noticed that they were there, but they still hadn't moved. Perhaps they'd received no orders. Maybe the queen or whoever had a plan in mind. But Red didn't intend to wait to find out. Charm. Nearly all the ants turned at once to face Rare. They were the ones that failed to resist. Charm. The ones all the back in the back were larger and only about a third of those successfully resisted. It was way more effective than she predicted it would be. Marion, if you would. Yes, boss. Marion took a step forward. Her, freeze, filled the room, and since the vast majority of ants just stood there, unmoving, the few who had resisted, charm, were helpless. Freeze, wasn't a particularly powerful spell, but if its numerous targets couldn't move, then it was child's play to affect them all. Marion's INT was quite high compared to a new player's. If Rare considered the ants all players who had just started the game as well, even though it wasn't a combat spell, they shouldn't be able to resist Marion's magic. The cave Rare first ended up in was home to a unique boss. Right outside the cave, there was another one. In that case, where were all the weak trash mobs for her early progression? In all likelihood, she believed they were these ants. Shortly thereafter, frost started to form on all the ants. The only things in this room that could still move were Rare and the Catquin girls. Drat, 
I should have turned that boar skin from earlier into a coat. It had gotten quite cold in these tunnels. Plus they'd have to step on all these frozen ants in order to proceed, too. It wasn't so bad that she couldn't suck it up, but she had to be ready to expend a lot of stamina weathering the low temperatures. Well, I didn't originally plan to spend that much time on this little romp, so let's just hurry up and get this over with. They had left the captured ant with Hakuma and the wolves, when they departed. It didn't seem like it would thaw out any time soon. Maybe Marion's INT was so high that they would remain in suspended animation until the freeze status was lifted. Or maybe the nest's temperature was low from the start, making it take longer for things to thaw. As for the ants in this room, they probably won't be able to move for at least a few hours. This room had become much colder than the wolves' lair as well. This battle concluded without issue. She might even say it went too smooth. Really? No one even executed a real attack at all. According to Rami, there was another room filled to the gills with ants up ahead. So then, before those ants came here as reinforcements, Rare's group should go and repeat what they just did here to wipe them all out. If they acted quickly enough, it was possible the Queen wouldn't know about what happened here yet. If they could make it to her before she realized their strategy, that would be perfect. All right, let's go. Be careful, but be swift. After that, they continued through a number of cramped rooms with low ceilings, each time using the same method to take out the ants there. Having seen more of the nest, Rare confirmed the layout of the tunnels and rooms was as she guessed. There were many branches, but she hit on the fact that the rooms serving more important functions were located as far away from the entrance as possible, that being the case. They wanted to keep delving down into the earth whenever they could. They had incapacitated a considerable number of ants. They had gone without stopping, and while it was completely one-sided between their combat strength and the overwhelming effectiveness of their spells, they had still earned a ton of XP. Each ant was only worth about 4 XP on average, but they had already accumulated 400 NN. Up ahead is different from the rooms before. There isn't a big group of ants. There's only one. Apparently they had completely wiped out the defense network. Unless they had arrived at the wrong room, like an egg room or food storage, it was the queen's room. Guess she didn't have any royal guards or anything like that. All right. Time for the big finale. T.L. Notes. Hakima, is literally white demon, but is also a term that refers to heavy snowfall. Ginka, for silver flower, as described in the chapter. It's simply a poetic description of snow. All the wolf pups were named in Katakana, but given the theme, I'm confident these are the correct kanji. Mizu, for sleet. Ara, for hailstone. Hayu, for hail. Fubuki, for blizzard. Kogom, from, Kogamiuki, for powder snow. CH15. The chamber they arrived at was about as big as all the previous ones, but the ceiling was much higher. And all the way in the back, there was a single ant but far larger than any they had seen thus far. It had wings too. That must be the queen. Since she had wings, she must have only begun building this nest rather recently. Either that or it was just a feature of that type of ant. Chikijijijiji. She was trying to say something. Or so rare thought, but unfortunately she had no idea what it might want to say. Either way, she wouldn't give her opponent the initiative to attack. Since there was only a single enemy, she would start things off with, stupefy. Stupefy. Oh, it worked. I thought she'd be immune since she's a boss. All right then, charm. Arg, so she can resist that. Given Rare's build, she wanted to lead off with, Stupefy, for the debuff followed by, Charm, which would have its success rate increased by Stupefy. That didn't work, so maybe the Queen had some kind of special resistance. Or because they were the same sex, the charm wasn't as effective. And because the Queen resisted, Charm. She also recovered from the stupefy debuff. Mental magic, was inextricably linked to its debuffs. If even a single spell was resisted, the chain would break and the target's mental state would return to normal. That was how this style of magic worked. Marion, use, freeze. Everyone else, keep it in check from a distance. I need you to buy me a little time until my, stupefy, cools down. Roger, freeze. Having come back from being stupefied, the queen tried to charge at Rare. Aiming at her initial movements, Rumi and Riley let loose arrows that hit the queen's front legs, causing her to fall to the ground. The freeze spell had an immediate effect, so even though she quickly tried to stand back up, her movements were sluggish, 
and she was immediately struck in the head by the sword that Kerry had thrown. The sword bounced off harmlessly with a metallic clang, but it did seem to stun the queen. In that time, Marion's freeze had lowered the temperature even more, causing the queen's movements to slow even more. While she continued trying to get back up, Riley and Rumi both threw their own melee weapons, trying to keep her down. Kerry then picked up someone's thrown weapon and once again aimed at the queen's head, this time attacking her directly. By that time, the queen's body temperature had dropped low enough that she could barely throw a proper attack, but it was still one that Kerry couldn't avoid. Dot all right, stupefy. Dot it worked, so this time, I'll try, control. This being the second successful, stupefy, its effective duration was even shorter. Without, charm, being chained first, its success rate wouldn't be as high, but Rare gambled on, control, to end it. She could feel the queen putting up quite a bit of resistance but in the end the control went through, and the queen's dull movements stopped completely. I hope I won't find out that even you were already tamed by someone else. Now, let's dive in. Subordinate, the queen wasn't moving even an inch, so it probably couldn't even perceive what was happening right beside it, but Rare could feel that the queen had completely surrendered to her. She could now see the queen's stats. She could also see its race name, Vespoid Queen. Huh? You weren't an ant? The name indicated that she was a Vespini. Rare thought she was an ant, but she was actually closer to a hornet. The soldier ants didn't immediately come under her control. She could feel that there was a time lag before it would happen, but the queen's followers did indirectly become her own underlings. Named enemy, Vespoid Quendum, has been defeated. Unlocked personal area, former Quendum. Register, former Quendum, as primary home. As she had predicted. This was the same thing that had happened with the Mountain Cat Bandit group. Quendam felt like it was on a scale too grand for what took place here, but like with the Cat Queen girls, maybe this was a unique boss that was still maturing. There certainly were a lot of enemies, but nothing on the level of a nation. In any case, she could finally take a break. She would make this place her home base, which would free up the previous base. That would let another player find it and make it their home. It was close to a human country but it was within monster territory, so she wasn't sure whether a human race player or a monster race player would end up claiming it. Ah, shoot. I wonder if there's a source of clean water here. It'll be hard to live here if there's no water nearby. The queen still couldn't move yet, but she was still able to convey her thoughts. According to the queen, while expanding the nest, the ants had apparently uncovered an underground lake. Rare's first base was naturally connected to an underground lake. But here they had dug their way to one, the two bases weren't very far away from each other, so perhaps the two lakes shared the same source. If possible, they should really survey this entire area before someone else claimed the other base as their home. Or actually, if we made a tunnel from here to the other base, would the two become recognized as a single home area? I wonder. This matter required some investigation. Rare could feel excitement growing within her. In order to test it out. We'll need the ants to all heal back up. One day probably wouldn't be enough time. I could summon Hukuma and the wolves to this room, but then they couldn't get back out. This place needs to undergo some serious renovation. We've gotten tons of XP, though. I want to teach everyone some magic. Her current log in session would soon hit 12 hours. She would soon receive a warning message if she didn't log out briefly. She would have wanted to use the ball pelt she had obtained, but it hadn't been tanned yet so it was quite pungent, she could tell as soon as she took it out. Tanning required the, leathercraft, skill, which should be able to do the deed even without the right chemicals through the power of magic. It would be useful to have someone learn it. I apologize for the abrupt announcement, but I'm going to take a nap. When I wake up, we'll discuss our future activities. R, it's fine if there isn't a place to sleep. I'll just lay down over there. See you later, then. They would need to work on making the base more comfortable but it was also important to make do with what they had sometimes. After stopping the catkin girls from taking off their clothes to make a temporary bed for air, she quickly lay down to sleep and logged out. CH16. First, gotta make a character. Having returned home from work, he booted up the VR apparatus in his room to let it warm up while he ate, bathed, and took care of other chores. This was the latest VR machine available on the market. So while it may not look the same, it had the same high specs as the machines used in healthcare. It cost many times the amount an average office worker took home each year. 
but he didn't have a job that took place in VR, he was required to go on site to work, and that meant his earnings could easily afford the luxury. In other words, he was very well compensated. With the propagation of VR technology, people rarely needed to leave their homes, but there were still places that required staff to be there in person. Even though the healthcare industry was integrated with VR, patients still needed to go to healthcare facilities to be hospitalized and for things like surgery, so healthcare workers were needed there as well. He was one of those workers. Due to the nature of this work, compared to a more common occupation like office worker, he had to spend a lot more time commuting. Therefore, the time he could spend on his only hobby, video games, was very limited. Because of that, he spent all his pay on gaming peripherals and premium paid content. He had purchased this brand new VR apparatus just for the game he was about to log into and play. Since all information about the closed beta test was going to be completely hidden from the public, he had applied to the beta, got in and spent what little time he had available enjoying the game. He had become so enamored by it that he decided to dip into his savings to pay for this VR apparatus. He was hoping it would arrive before the game's official launch, and it got delivered just before the open beta was announced. He finished setting it up yesterday, and so it was all ready and waiting for him once he was done with work today. After creating a character with just about the same build that he had in the closed beta, he named his character, Wayne and dove into the game world, having chosen, handsome, from the new innate characteristics system, he didn't have enough XP to get everything he wanted, but if he spent a few days grinding he was sure he'd be able to get one or two spells, alright, let my other world adventure begin. An hour later, he finally found himself standing in a wide open prairie. Why does it take an entire hour to get through the tutorial? They should have let people who were in the closed beta skip it or something. The tutorial support AI kept going on and on about basically the outlook of the world and the game's ambience and whatever. Having played hard during the closed beta, he thought this all came way too late. The AI back then was already nearly perfect. He didn't feel any uneasiness about NPCs acting human. It was pointless for him to now be told that there was no difference between NPCs and PCs. Or I guess since the system can't tell the difference between PCs and NPCs, it has to treat everyone the same from the very start, I guess. There was a horror story posted online, during the closed beta, a player inappropriately touched a shopkeeper thinking they were an NPC when they were actually a crafting specialized player. After that incident, no player would sell that person any items for the rest of the closed beta. Switching gears, Wayne looked around at the prairie. He could vaguely make out a townscape far in the distance. Wayne had chosen one of the human countries, Highs, for his starting area. Highs was a coastal country, but it had mountains and valleys as well. It thrived off its primary industries, farming in particular. It also had three large rivers running through it which it used for transporting and distributing lumber and minerals. The country's largest fishing harbor sat on one of these rivers, and it played a crucial role in exporting crops and other products. The abundant riverhead and plentiful firewood also allowed blacksmiths to flourish, so there really wasn't any industry that the country lacked. There weren't any particularly wealthy residents, but neither was there extreme poverty. It was a stable country. Wayne picked this country partially for its stability, which meant it was quite safe but also just because it was where he began back in the closed beta. It was a country that could easily support whatever activities a new player might want to pursue, making it good for beginners, meaning a lot of players started here. Wayne promptly took out a beginner's one-handed sword from his inventory and fastened it to his waist. If he had learned, shield, then he would have also received some kind of buckler, but in games like this it wasn't a good idea to start off burdening both hands at once. It was his style to choose only one thing to master at the beginning. Anyway, Wayne had learned, one-handed sword, parry, and, quick-witted, for his starting skills, then put the rest of his points in STR and Agi, a stereotypical speed-based melee build. At some point he would learn some magic and aim to become something like a mage knight. To that end, he chose to be a human for the balanced starting XP, according to the tutorial, until he got to the city, Wayne as he was now should be able to easily defeat any monsters he encountered. As a new character, he would set himself up in that city and just work on earning XP and money for now. As he got closer to the city, he spotted a forest on the other side of it, 
probably monster territory. Due to monster territory being so close, he also saw a sturdy wall separating the two. Wayne wasn't familiar with this particular city, but a player's starting location was chosen randomly, so that it was just luck of the draw. If the country were poor or politically unstable, then it couldn't afford a wall, even to protect the city from monster territory, or, the order to build a city wall wouldn't have come from the country itself. But Hayes wasn't like that. It would of course install a wall to defend against threats from monster territory, it would protect its borders as fervently as it did its capital. The forest was probably a good source of both XP and money. It was located in a beginner zone, after all, he didn't think there'd be any particularly powerful monsters. Oops. It's a wild rabbit. From its name and appearance, it really was just a wild hare, but he'd take damage if he took it easy. He probably wouldn't die to it, but that mentality was also a form of hubris. With Wayne's build and his own skill as a player, he could probably avoid getting hit even if he only had starting equipment. The wild rabbit all of a sudden flattened itself against the ground. Parry. He timed his. Parry to intercept the wild rabbit that had leapt at him. The skill either defended against an attack and dealt counterattack damage, or repelled the attack and caused the opponent to stumble. If, parry, was successful, the player repelled, but if it failed, the player only partially blocked. Here, the wild rabbits faltered, and it was completely open to an attack from the side. Yes, take this. Wayne stabbed his one-handed sword at the wild rabbit over and over defeating it. A results screen appeared and awarded him a small amount of XP. At this rate, I don't know when I'll be able to learn some magic. Guess I really should get to town, set myself up, then go check out that forest. Earning XP was always a time-consuming activity. In all the old MOOCs, endgame content was just characters at max level farming for newer and better equipment and items, and those games focused all their efforts on extending the game in that manner. However, people began to tire of that gameplay model and complained that it alienated newer, younger gamers. At that time, VR technology had begun to make huge leaps in advancement, so gaming entered an age of fully immersive VR. There had already been a period where gamers played games by actually moving their bodies, but the industry was looking for something new, in a different style from that. Then came the rise of games where the player wasn't expected to play for a long time after hitting max level but instead the very act of hitting max level required an enormously long time. As it so happens sometimes, there was even a period where lots of games had players hit max level extremely quickly, but they died out simply because character progression was bland and uninteresting. With the advent of VR technology, games focusing on the journey of the character itself grew in popularity, and games that focused primarily on endgame content vanished. Influenced by that trend, Today's hardcore gamers enjoyed very slowly taking tiny steps to earn experience points and level up their characters. Once I get to the city, the first thing I'll do is find an inn and rent out a room. Then I'll go to the Selzord Guild and check if there are any quests in or around the forest. After putting the wild rabbit's carcass in his inventory, Wayne resumed his journey to the city. By the time he arrived, he had hunted several wild rabbits. CH17. The city was walled so guards were stationed at the gates. They were there to keep criminals out, of course, but the wall's primary purpose was to defend against monsters, so entrance procedures weren't very strict. For Wayne, or really for any players who didn't have any form of identification, they could enter as long as they didn't have any contraband in their possession. Players all had inventories, though, so they could get past that sole restriction with ease anyway. After asking the guards where to find a good inn, he began to make his way to that part of town. Now that he was inside the city, there shouldn't be any danger to his person, but he wanted to promptly update his respawn point. You generally respawned at the last place you logged in, so he was planning to log out quick at the inn. The inn recommended by the guard was pretty run down, but unlike NPCs, he wouldn't actually be sleeping there and his belongings were stored in his inventory so they couldn't be stolen. Inns were also designated as safe zones, where thievery and other kinds of hostile actions couldn't be initiated. Finally, he didn't want to waste any money on his first inn anyway. After checking in, he found his room furnished with a wooden bed, straw mattress, threadbare blankets, and nothing else. The very picture of a cheap hotel room. From the perspective of the guard, Wayne was wearing a cheap shirt and pants and he had a dull short sword, 
he was the perfect example of a newly minted warrior. Since the guard assumed that he probably didn't have any money, it was with all the best intentions that he recommended this inn, and that assumption wasn't wrong at all. Since Wayne did want to save money if at all possible, he really was thankful. Log out for a second, then immediately log back in. He had three days off starting tomorrow, so there was no need to worry about real life. This next gen VR apparatus was completely wireless, so he wouldn't even have to disconnect to eat or use the bathroom. That said, after spending three whole days playing, he'd have to remember to do some light stretching and exercise before going into work. As soon as he logged back in, Wayne immediately went to the Silzord Guild to look for a quest. After getting directions from the innkeeper, he went down the main street to get there. He might be in the city, but he could still get into trouble if he ended up in the alleys or other less frequented areas. In order to emerge unscathed from those kinds of encounters, he'd need to be a bit stronger first. Knowing the way there, he wasn't in danger of getting lost. This being a city built at the border inside a wall, it required rather detailed blueprints, and its construction followed them to the letter. If he did get lost, he could just find his way back to the main street to regain his bearings. Since it was the middle of the day, the Silzord Guild didn't have many Silzords at the moment. For normal businesses with daytime hours, most people would be working now. He headed to the counter to let them know he'd be working out of this town for the foreseeable future. There wasn't any kind of registration. Silzords were mostly outlaws, in the first place. They were prone to dying or deserting at the drop of a hat, so there was little value in overseeing their activities. Furthermore, rewards were all or nothing. If you didn't return successful, even if you worked yourself to death in the process, you wouldn't get paid. Ignoring the fact that players couldn't die. Next. Wayne asked about selling the wild rabbits he had killed on the road. The bodies could be sold as they were as materials, minus the fees for processing and commission. Normally, dead bodies would slowly degrade, so carrying them back like that would mean their price would drop like a rock. However, Wayne had stored them in his inventory, so they were still fresh. He pulled out five wild rabbit corpses and placed them on the counter. So you're a safe holder. Ya got a rare skill, ya do. The receptionist looked mildly surprised. NPCs rarely were born with a skill that they called a safe. It was essentially the same as the inventory that Wayne used. That meant that NPCs all recognized players as people with this skill. Though actually, it's not so much a rare phenomenon as it's just the number of players who can use inventory dwarf the number of NPCs who can. If the date came that he heard I've been seeing a lot of folks like you recently, he was 100% sure that all those people would be other players. After getting paid for the wild rabbits, he immediately went to find the quest board and browse the requests. The Silzord Guild posted all the requests it received there. However, requests that were taken off the board by mercenaries were voided. They just had to confirm the request, report its completion to the receptionist and that was when the request would be taken down. Lucrative requests resulted in lots of competition. But there was no way to know if someone else was out there working on any given request. That's why it was important to check the board before anyone else, and to complete requests before anyone else did. It wasn't rare for someone to spend a day working, then come back to find that someone else had already completed a request they had tried to do. Unless it was a wholly unique job, it was best to find another, similar request that you could switch to if necessary. This being how requests worked. The clients also had to carefully consider how to designate the rewards. If the reward was high, it would naturally get completed quickly, but splitting the reward into multiple requests could also result in immediate results. However, if the ensuing reward ended up too low, then the commission fee could scare people away from taking it. It was hard to find the right balance. There was even a demand for specialized reward brokers. Wayne wanted to find low reward requests. Ones that had been posted some time ago. Those kinds of requests were unlikely to be undertaken by others. Apparently, requests that necessitated going near the forest were not very popular. How convenient. After leaving the Selzord Guild, Wayne immediately set off for the forest. The guards warned him on the way out that the edge of monster territory was somewhere in the forest. Making up a random excuse to leave the city anyway, Wayne entered the forest. Even if monster territory began in the forest, it should just be a regular forest up until that point. The forest was dense and overgrown with trees, 
to the point that it was dim and gloomy in the middle of the day. He could only see his own footprints in the dirt, so he questioned whether the locals ever came here. While he wasn't exactly used to walking in forests, he did have some experience, so he was somehow able to work on his quests. Dot making it through the forest was a lot more trouble than Wayne had been imagining. He didn't think he would be able to get by with the equipment he had now. He needed a hatchet to clear the brush and vines, and he needed clothes that covered up more skin. His starting equipment would quickly fall apart at this rate. Having concluded that delving any deeper would be equivalent to suicide, Wayne decided to head back to the city for now. He couldn't finish any quests, but it should be fine to put them on hold for now. Until he saved up more money, he would return to that prairie to hunt more rabbits, and if possible, look for quests that could be done there as well. In the end, Wayne went back to the starting prairie and hunted another ten or so wild rabbits that day. CH18, I'm trying something new, so I want to look completely different from the usual me. It was finally time for the open beta test of this highly anticipated game. Normally she wouldn't be interested, but because she unexpectedly had a huge block of free time, she thought she'd try her hand at the VR gaming which she had always disliked for no real reason. This VR apparatus was normally reserved for healthcare purposes, but it could also be used for other things. She thought she might as well see how it worked for gaming, another reason to do it. She had heard that this game was revolutionary compared to all the VR games that had come before it. The game truly brings you to another world, or so all the famous celebrities claimed. If she could really live in another world, then she wanted to see how a life completely different from the one she had led up until now played out. With that thought in mind, she declined to let the avatar be generated from a full scan of her body and dove right into the character creator, Skeleton. I wonder how that'll look. Maybe it'll be cute. I'll pick that as my race. Whoa, it's really just all bones. Where'd all the meat go? Too. For someone like her, who didn't game, she didn't really have a concrete concept of how skeleton would work as a race in a game. She didn't think it would literally be just a skeleton. However, this was a rare chance to try something new. She may not have realized it at the start, but now it was the race that she had chosen. It might have felt a little too foreign at first, but as far as different from the usual her went, nothing could be more different than this. All right, I'll be a skeleton. After picking a race, next was configuring skills. That said, she had no idea what skills were good in games. I wonder what skills would be good for a skeleton. I've got no clue. Ah, it'd be cool to be able to use magic. Let's learn some. Since I have no idea what's good, I'll just pick whatever sounds neat instead. She went to the trees for, fire magic, water magic, wind magic, earth magic, ice magic, and, lightning magic, and learned one skill from each. I still have some XP left. Ah. Since I'm a skeleton, I got an extra 100 XP. Cool bins tilde. Alright, let's use the rest on my stats. Magic probably gets better with this INT one. Then I'll just use it all on INT, since it's my leftover XP anyway. And so, she finished creating her character. My name will be. Let's go with, Blink. I've got beautiful white skin after all. Cause it's really just bones. Next, Blink chose to start in a cave in monster territory then logged in. After sitting through the tutorial, Blink spawned in a dark, wet cave surrounded by natural stone walls. Dark was a bit of an understatement, though, since there was absolutely no light, making it pitch black. For Blink, though, it really was only dark due to the effect of her, skeleton, race special ability, night vision. According to the tutorial support AI, Apparently new players would spawn somewhere with enemies that they could defeat. Blink decided to first find the entrance to the cave. However, since she had no idea where it could be, she just picked a random direction and started walking. Having never been in a natural cave before, neither in real life nor in VR, she kept tripping on various objects. After several minutes of walking, the road split, on one side, the cave continued as normal, on the other, it turned into a passage or more like a tunnel, that was so small that she'd need to crawl on her hands and knees to keep going. However, the tunnel looked smooth and slippery, like it was clearly trying to say that it led somewhere. After pondering for a moment, Blink chose the suspicious tunnel. This was her first game, after all. She wanted to make choices that she absolutely never would under normal circumstances. The floor of the tunnel was smooth as well, so crawling on it didn't hurt. However, 
she should feel some pain simply from crawling while supporting her own body weight. Her knees and palms should have turned completely red as well. Fortunately, she currently had a body of bones, she felt lighter than she normally was, had no skin that could be harmed, and had no muscles to get sore. Blink patted herself on the back for being insightful enough to choose to be a skeleton as she continued cluttering down the tunnel. The cramped tunnel finally ended and she found herself in a place that was just barely high enough to walk. I seem to have reached some kind of room. There was an ant here, but it was about the size of a Shiba Inu. E -e. And it wasn't alone. Three ants turned toward Blink and began to approach her, their antennae constantly flicking around. They would normally have just been black silhouettes in the darkness, but with her night vision, Blink could see them looking right at her. She recognized something about them. She had seen something similar before in the VR library, in the pages of an illustrated reference book depicting insects from the far past, the face of a hornet, Jaya. Blink screamed reflexively. The ants interpreted the screaming as hostile and rushed to attack her. Ah, fuck. This ain't no time for screaming, monsters. I, I need to attack, um, magic. The ants were fast but not so fast that Blink wouldn't be able to react in time. As long as she calmed down, she should be able to cast her magic. However, the ants got to her first since Blink wasted too much time calming herself down. While she was going over how to cast magic in her head, the ants were already chomping at her legs. What? The ants are eating me. The ants mercilessly crunched on Blink's leg bones. The dog-sized ants had large pincers while her bony legs were quite skinny. They vigorously broke off one of her legs and chewed on it in their mouths. The game's default settings filtered out most of the pain, but seeing her own leg being held aloft in the jaws of giant ants was a brand new, horrifying experience. And even if there was barely any pain, the sensation of having her bones being attacked directly was unforgettable on a primal level. Oh shit oh shit stop it stop it. Blink tried to somehow kick off the ants, but since she was all bone, her kicks didn't have much effect, the ant's jaws actually dug further into her leg, causing her even more damage. After she kicked again, a different ant clamped onto her remaining leg, causing her to fall over. Uh, a. As they're waiting for Blink's head to drop down, the last ant pointed its butt at her curled up body. Or oh, wait, since this was an insect, it wasn't its butt, but rather its abdomen. Hole. Oh, way I. The ant sprayed a foul-smelling liquid from the stinger at the end of its abdomen connected to its poison sac, and it splashed all over Blink's upper half. Her body began letting off unhealthy-looking streams of smoke as it dissolved. Usually, Blink's field of vision faded to black. In the total darkness, the only thing she could see was a message accompanied by what looked like a timer steadily counting down. One hour until automatic resurrection. Would you like to respawn immediately? R. so I died. But for real, having my legs bitten off and getting sprayed in the face with acid is way too hardcore. Why the hell does it feel so realistic? It didn't really hurt, but still, this could really fuck someone up in the head. Wow, this game is hard. You've gotta be good to play this. Or maybe I just really suck. But well, it might be gross, but it's not like super painful or hard or anything. If I think of it like paying for my own mistakes. Then I guess I just got to get over it. She had gotten confused when the first other living thing she encountered in the game, setting aside the question of whether a skeleton was living was suddenly so hostile to her. Now that she could consider things rationally, though, she just felt frustrated, thinking to herself I should have done this at that point or I should have been more like that. Alright, if I wait and revive here, the ants will probably attack me again. So respawn? That way I'd return to where I first started. Ah, I wonder if there's some kind of penalty for dying. Before she respawned, she should check out the help for details on the death penalty. Looks like if you die and the system determines that you need to be respawned, you lose 10% of your XP. That's harsh. Dot ah, but if your total XP is low enough, then there is no penalty. Let's see. The max amount with no penalty is 200 XP. Skeletons are right on the line, huh? If goblins die once, then they'll end up weaker than they started. You monster races took on demerits to start with more XP, but you'd lose all that if you messed up even once. Pretty crazy. I guess skeletons really are the best. So I'll just respawn. There. After a moment of dizziness. Blink was once more standing in the cave where she first woke up. This time I'll be more careful. Or rather, 
This time I won't go into that tunnel. I bet I'm not supposed to go that way until I get stronger. Yep. TL notes. Ooh boy. Japanese puns. 1. Stereotypical L. A joke that only makes sense in Japanese. The character's name is Comma, which can be read as Bran or Blan. The title of the chapter is clearly a riff on Bran New Game, but the naming joke is because she went with Blank, as in French for white, which is why she jokes about having white skin. 2. Dot. Dot. Exclamation mark. Literally. Su keraton. Skeleton. I wonder what that is. It sounds kinda cute. I'll pick that as my race. Wait. It's just bones. Even if it's supposed to be see-through. Sukaru slash. This is a bridge too far. It would have been hard to think of a joke revolving around misreading skeleton without making her sound incredibly stupid or like illiterate. And I didn't want to go back and change the race name for the sake of this one joke. So I just avoided it altogether and relegated the explanation to TL notes. CH19. Before Blink went back out into the cavern, she wanted to make sure she knew how to cast magic. She wanted to be ready to fire some off at a moment's notice, so she would be a lot more cautious while walking around this time. She couldn't tell the difference between the walls, so she just picked one and followed it. Blink wanted to go in the opposite direction from the first time. But all she did was go in the opposite direction of where she was looking when she respawned, so she didn't actually know if this was the way she really wanted to go or not. She progressed a lot more slowly, taking much more time than before. When she finally hit a fork in the road, the tunnel from before, R, wait, last time the tunnel was on the left, but this time it's on the right. If she had accidentally ended up going the same way as last time, then the tunnel should be on the same side as it was before. But if she had gone in the opposite direction, and the tunnel was on the opposite side, that would mean that based on the way she was facing now, the ant colony should be on the right half of the cave. Dot so I should keep going into the left half. Doing her best not to look into the side tunnel, Blink chose the left fork. But as soon as she got close to the tunnel, a familiar foul smell tickled her nose. Ah, acid poured over her from the side. She lost all feeling in her body. And, unable to stay standing, she clattered down into a sitting position. Even more acid rained down on her head, and Blink's vision went dark. One hour until automatic resurrection. Would you like to respawn immediately? For real. Even though she did her best to avoid the ant nest, if she were to encounter an ant, she had been prepared to blast it instantly. She never imagined that she could die immediately from a surprise attack, though. Those ants are really bloodthirsty, huh? Now that it had come to this, she should just aggressively dive into their nest and kill them all, otherwise she'd never get out of here. Having made that determination, Blink psyched herself up as she accepted the system respawn. Dot, huh? There was an ant right in front of her. A monster was suddenly at her original spawn point. Apparently that could happen. However, Blink was done being caught off guard. She instantly switched gears and cast her first magic spell. It's just an ant. All right. Flare arrow. Right after she shouted the activation keyword, an arrow made of fire materialized right before her eyes and flew straight at the ant she targeted. The arrow pierced through the ant's head, then conflagrated its entire body. Once the fire burned itself out, only the ant's abdomen remained. Magic. Is hella awesome. I burned one of those super strong ants to cinders with just one attack. The ashes smelled kind of weird. But Blink approached them to survey the remains. I thought there would be a uh, drops. Or whatever, monster materials. But maybe that spell was overkill. But wow, this smell. It's the same as the smell is from grilling dried squid. Man, there might be no pain in this game, but it sure just shits out trauma. For the time being, Blink decided to just store the ant's abdomen in her inventory. The acid that had melted her twice should be in that part. No reason to throw it away if it could turn out to be useful later. In any case, she discovered an effective method of fighting ants. Shoot, flare arrows, from outside the range of their acid. As long as she had MP, it should work. Kill them before they kill me was the attitude she adopted. The current question was where to go from here. No matter which way she went. The ant nest would be connected. Although since she did plan to actually kill all the ants, then it didn't matter which way she picked. Blink decided to stop worrying too much about it. She just picked a direction randomly and started walking. Before long, she spotted a tunnel to the left. She approached it cautiously, then nervously peeked inside. There were no ants. So now, 
Blank was conflicted. Since the coast was clear right now, she wanted to keep going. But these bastards had already killed her twice. She wasn't sure if she should just let that pass. When she had respawned the second time, she thought about proactively going into the tunnel and wiping them all out. If instead she ignored them and continued on, she couldn't be sure that she wouldn't run into the nest again later. She might even start jumping at shadows. Blink decided to take the tunnel. The same one as the first time, except this time she would be on her guard while she crawled. She should be coming up on a chamber soon. She was thinking about what magic she should use when she saw a bunch of ants waiting at the entrance to the room. Ah, crap. Her only option was to retreat. However, she couldn't turn around in this cramped tunnel. As she kept her eyes on the ants in front of her, she slowly began to crawl backward. Clonk. Her bony rear hit something hard. She gingerly turned her neck to look behind her. What her butt had hit was an ant's head. Well, obviously. What else could it have been? One hour until automatic resurrection. Would you like to respawn immediately? You have lost XP. It was an ambush. So they could do that too. Now that she thought about it, the AI person from the tutorial did say something about the system seeing players, NPCs, and monsters as the same. The monster AI was probably learning and developing countermeasures. She was dying in the same general area over and over. So they came up with strategies to deal with that. She should probably just forget about the tunnel. In the first place, when she respawned the first time, she did consider that it was an area that required her to be stronger to go in. That was what she had originally thought, unrelated to the ants. Obviously, if she encountered any anyway, that was another story. She had to kill or be killed. How many times had she accepted the respawn now? And of course, an ant was already waiting the right before her eyes. I knew this would happen. Flare arrow. However, that wasn't the only ant here. I thought this might happen. Flare arrow. Huh? I can't cast it. Why not? R. There's a cooldown. One hour until automatic resurrection. Would you like to respawn immediately? You have lost XP. You 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 are you. Isn't this game just way too hard? What am I supposed to do? This time, Blink decided not to respawn right away and started looking into how to cast magic spells in succession. She needed to wait an hour to respawn anyway, so it should be fine to do some research in the meantime. Blink opened up the game's official social networking site. It had a bulletin board system, which was pretty rare these days. She didn't know what the term meant, though. Probably a board where things were bulletined or something. She looked for threads on the bulletin board that were about magic. Some were started by players who did a lot of testing, and those threads got a lot of replies. She searched for ones that explained continuous casting. According to a player who went by the weird moniker Nameless Elf, you can't use the same spell multiple times in a row, but you can cast a different spell right away. However, if you do, the first spell's cooldown will be paused until the second spell has cooled down. In other words, if you cast a flare arrow, followed by ice bullet, where each spell had a cooldown of 5 seconds, flare arrow, couldn't be used again until 10 seconds after the original, flare arrow, had been cast, it seemed, how confusing, but well, I guess I get it, since I learned 6 different kinds of magic, that means I could cast up to 6 spells in a row, some of her spells trees didn't include any offensive magic, but she was still capable of an attack barrage of 5. She was starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel now. If she coordinated her cooldowns correctly, and she tried to fight a group of ants while running away, she probably wouldn't die immediately. Even if this plan didn't work, she had already lost the XP for killing the one ant to the death penalty. She had nothing left to lose. All regged. I'll give it a try. A pen to cast. She was psyching herself up out loud. But in her head she was still calmly working out the order for casting each spell and the timing and such while preparing to accept the respawn. The current spawn point is within another character's personal area. You cannot spawn here. You do not have any other valid spawn points. You will spawn at a random location within the starting spawn zone. Huh? A. Eh? Blink had been staring at the word respawn for so long that she started to experience just or to fall. Once she could see again. She looked around but didn't recognize the area. It was certainly some kind of cave, but it was much more spacious than the place where she had been respawning all this time. Where is this? She didn't actually know where the first cave was anyway, but she did at least recognize that this was a different cave. She could tell the color of the rock face was different, among other things. Or more like, how did my spawn point end up in someone else's area? CH20. Before just now, 
she should have been able to respawn without problem. There had been ants everywhere, though, so she wasn't actually respawning completely problem free, but still. Now it's someone's private area so I can't respawn anymore. I had only been looking at the message board for like 20 minutes, and in that time, someone. Did they buy a whole plot of land, including that cave? Or like, can you buy land? Once I get better at this game, I totally want to buy a house for me to rest my bones. But that first cave should have had a ton of ants in it. Can you buy land even when there's still monsters there? If so, then as long as you had enough money, you could beat all those monsters without fighting. If you had the budget of a country at your disposal, then you could just buy up all the land in order to get rid of monster territory. However, the human countries and the monster territories were constantly fighting for land. Normally you'd think that if someone were already there, then you can't just become the owner of that area. That means that in the however long I was dead, someone was able to kill off all the ants? Was something like that even possible? Even if there were players who had started the instant the game became available, the game had only been out for about half a day. She didn't think anyone could possibly get strong enough to farm those super strong ants in such a short amount of time. Ugh, I get it. There might be people who've been living in this world all along who are that strong. I just assumed it was a player, but I guess NPCs can also have personal areas. Or like, if NPCs can do it, then monsters should be able to do it too, maybe the ants themselves were the ones who had owned the place first, if they were like regular ants, then it wouldn't be strange for there to be a queen ant. The ants could have been in the process of taking control of the cave at the queen's orders. Blink could have been an intruder that happened to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Then, while she was dead, their extermination force could have eliminated all other remaining enemies turning the cave into the ants territory and thus rendering Blink unable to spawn. That seems like the most likely explanation. But this happened while I was trying to accept the res, meaning my corpse should have been there. I wonder what would happen if someone res me after the ants had taken control of the zone. Blink tried to look it up in the help documentation but she couldn't figure out which section might have the answer. The help console suggested questions spanned too many different categories, and her vague search terms weren't enough to lead her to an appropriate help topic. Let's just try conditions for resurrection first. Go. The conditions to resurrect were, I'm curious about the third and fourth conditions. She wasn't sure if there was more than 50% of her corpse remaining. Blink couldn't remember which attack ended up being the fatal one. But since she died almost instantly, she doubted it had been a biting attack. If it was acid, then depending on how many ants had done the deed, it was possible for less than half of her body to be left after a number of seconds had passed. She didn't know how to tell if an area didn't allow resurrection, but it was possible that after the ants conquered the cave, it turned into a no-res area. Blink had killed two ants, though, and she was pretty sure they couldn't respawn without limit. However, the zone declaration only specified resurrections, so enemy respawns were probably unaffected. But then yeah, over half of Blink's corpse was missing, so the system identification should have updated the classification from Blink's corpse to Blink's drops. The system message said one hour until automatic resurrection, but if someone tried to res her, they'd probably get some kind of error. It was possible for her to receive a res but she wasn't necessarily eligible to be rezzed. Since Blink didn't leave any items behind, the ants' conquest conditions were met, and the cleared cave became their territory. Something like that probably happened. Damn it, I swear I'll go clean out that ant nest once I get stronger. That said, she had no idea how far away her current cave was from the ant nest. Before she powered up, she needed to get the basics of the game down first. Lacking that foundation was one of the reasons she kept dying to ants. You could say, Blink's only weapon was magic. She thought that using, fire magic, on the ants had been overkill, and maybe early enemies had a weakness that let her take them down in one attack. But she had to avoid letting her guard down. She couldn't forget this lesson she had learned from the ants. I've already gotten in the habit, so I should be ready to instantly cast, flare arrow. All right then, first it was ants, what's next? Regaining her focus. Blink started cautiously exploring this cave. It was more expansive and well lit than the ant's nest. Just like before, though, her night vision was doing a lot of work, so it was probably actually rather dark. If I conquer this place, I wonder if I can make it my own base. It's nice and bright here. 
so it would be neat if I could. Her current goal was to take over this cave. As long as there were no other players competing for it, it shouldn't be impossible for her. Also, as long as the monsters weren't ants. As Blink walked through the cave, the decor suddenly changed. In particular, the walls changed from bare, natural rock face to something man-made. Looking at it, the stone structure seemed very old, since it was full of holes and gaps and covered in moss here and there. This feels like some kind of ruin. I'm glad it's not another ant nest, but I wonder what kind of animals live in ruins. Even though this was a starting area, it's not like the possible enemies were limited only to wild animals, but the ants left such a strong impression that Blink could now only imagine monsters based on real animals. Plus she got freaked out, screamed at them, couldn't react in time, and ended up dead. She felt so immature. Ah. Something's here. You are uh, bodies? Are these zombies? Jai are uh, gross. Stop making me fight shit that bites. One hour until automatic resurrection. Would you like to respawn immediately? CH21. After taking care of some chores, she logged back in. She opened her character's eyes and saw the exact same scene before her that she had seen when she had logged out. She had been logged off for about an hour. The queen was still covered in ice. The surface of her body looked very slightly wet but that was probably due to condensation rather than from the ice starting to melt. The queen's status was currently listed as, frozen. You're already up, boss. You all right with that short nap? Hello, Kerry. Yes, I do not need all that much sleep, but sometimes I do sleep for much longer. There might be times where she has something suddenly come up and cannot log in. She couldn't think of anything specific that might come up at the moment though. Rare asked if anything had happened while she was asleep. Apparently, Remy had gone back to check on her coma and the rest of the wolves. She was on her way back here now. The wolves were just resting back in the cave. In other words, in the last hour, her followers still had new experiences, and not only that, while their master was logged out, they could still act freely according to their own judgment. Thinking about it, while the player was logged out, their character was left behind sleeping. It wouldn't really make sense for the followers to disappear. Followers were also living residents of this world. In which case, while the player was logged out, maybe it was possible for the followers to go grinding for XP. Inconceivable, was this a way to officially bot? If it was, it would probably get patched immediately. She'd just have to try it out. She didn't particularly want to exploit the game or anything. If there were legitimate means to accomplish that within the game, though, then it was simply another way to enjoy the game. She had no malicious intentions. Kerry, sorry to ask so suddenly, but please go out to the forest and find anything really, a small animal, and hunt it for me. I'm going to doze again for a little bit. I'll try to wake up after about the same amount of time, so just stand by after that in the cave until I do. Sure thing, boss. Is it all right if I bring the others with me? Yes. Of course. I don't mind if you ask Hakuma and the other wolves to accompany you either. You can hunt whatever you like, but if you're going with Hakuma, then you can aim for bigger prey. Just don't bite off more than you can chew. In that case, if Hakuma can come, maybe we'll go for something around the same size as that boar we killed. I'll leave it to you. Oh, one moment. I want to speak to Rumi. What is it, boss? Ah. Uh. Rumi, I have another job I'd like you to do. Rare brought up Rumi's skill screen and had her learn, Levycraft S, Danning, skill. She then took out the boar hide from her inventory and laid it out before Rumi. I think you understand already, but you've learned there, Levycraft, skill, Rumi. You should now know how best to treat this hide, yes? Ah, yes, boss. I got it. I have to. Good. Do you need any tools? It'd be nice if I had some. But I can do it without any. Probably, she could even tan it without any special tools, how conveniently magical these skills were. Well then, while I'm sleeping, please go ahead and take care of that. It's fine if you're not done by the time I wake up, it's more important to do it correctly. Can you do that? Yes, boss. Well then, I shall once again go to sleep, for about the same amount of time as before. All right then, Kerry, Rami, I'll leave it to you. Okay, yeah, I got it. Boss. Asterisk. An hour later, Rare logged in again. Welcome back, boss. It was Rumi. There was a beautiful boar rug laid out on the ground. Hello, Rumi. I take it that you finished tanning the hide? Yes, boss. It took a lot less time than I thought it would, so I was watching boss sleep. Oh, 
How embarrassing. Did I do anything strange? You breathe real quiet. Oh, and your eyelashes are really long. It really seemed like Rumi just watched her sleep. However, if an NPC had been staring at her and didn't notice anything off, then it really was true that the player's character just slept the entire time. This was an unexpected finding. Carrie's group is still out? Yeah. Should I go check? No, it's fine. I'm sure they're on their way back. In the meantime, it was about time she gave the queen a name. Along with that, Rare would teach Remy, fire magic, so that the queen could be melted. It seemed the person herself, the ant herself was just patiently waiting as she melted. But while Rare did start to feel bad about her frozen state, in truth she was just getting sick of how cold the room was. Queen, your name is, Shuguru. The queen couldn't move. But Rare could tell that she had accepted the name. A Shuguru is not an ant or a hornet. But the Japanese word for the red banded sand wasp, which also goes by the name Jigabaki. However, Jigabaki was also an old term for women with attractively thin waists. It seemed like a fitting moniker for a queen. Rare herself used to affectionately be called wasp girl by her grandparents. She wasn't sure how old they had to have been to use that term. You really shouldn't give children pet names based on trivia that's so far removed from current modern sensibilities. Next, she acquired, fire magic, for Remy. Remy, this is your reward for your leather work. This is magic. I get to use it too. You did a wonderful job, Remy. Now, there's no need to wait. Why don't you try it out right away? Rare took hold of Remy's hand and brought her before Shuguru. Here, if you use heat, you can melt Shuguru from her frozen state. Be gentle with it at first. Since she also gave Rumi, magical affinity, fire, at the same time, Rumi probably wouldn't mess up, but Rare still cautioned her to be careful. Rumi timidly began to cast, heat, on Shuguru. If everything went well, all the other ants in the room could be freed in order as well. Even if they had to wait for Rumi's MP to regenerate, it would be faster than letting them melt naturally. R. Boss. Looks like Carrie and the others are back. Even while casting, Heat, Rumi was still able to make use of her exceptional hearing. Since it was probably way too far away to hear normal sounds at the cave entrance from here, Carrie had probably shouted that she was back or something. Please continue to take care of Sugary like that, Rumi. I will go greet the others. Rare made her way out to the main cave by crawling on her hands and knees through the tight tunnels. There. Kerry and the other girls were butchering their catch. It looked like some kind of tanuki, probably. This thing sure is large. The tanuki was about the same size as that boar from before. Considering how dense the trees grew in this forest, she wondered how all these giant beasts lived here. This was a very large forest, though, so maybe in the deeper parts, the trees weren't as close together and huge animals could live comfortably. Perhaps only the outer edges of the forest were dense. Although you'd normally think it'd be the opposite. We're back, boss. Wadi, I think. Big, right? Yes, it's amazing. Where did you find it? Somewhere far. Rare wanted to estimate the rough distance from the response. It probably wasn't too far away. Nah, we brought it down pretty close to here. Actually, we couldn't really find anything good to hunt. When we finally found something, I guess we ended up chasing it all the way here. We just finished it off a bit ago. We took too long, didn't we? Kerry finished apologetically. Rare lifted a hand and waved it in a don't worry about it kind of way as she pulled up everyone's skill windows. The reason she guessed that they must have killed it near here was because of this screen. When she had logged back in, it was very clear that nothing was earned from tanning the boar hide since she had the same amount of XP as when she had logged out. However, when she opened the skill window to teach Remy, fire magic, she had suddenly gained more XP. That was probably the moment that Kerry's group had killed the tanuki. This incident had established that when a player logged out, their followers could act independently afterward, and they could receive and follow orders beforehand. While they could accomplish tasks during this time, no XP would be earned for it. In all likelihood, as soon as they became followers, they lost the ability to earn XP for themselves. Instead, they receive XP from their leader, and their feats become the leader's feats. As a result, when the leader, the XP receptacle, is logged out, no one can earn XP during that time. Her dreams of officially sanctioned botting had been splendidly crushed. Well, not that she was expecting it to work in the first place. However, as far as farming money goes, that should still work. In fact, both Remy and Kerry's group had produced something of monetary value. Not only that, 
if she gave them tasks that would require time to complete while logged out, then later logged in with the right timing, it was even possible to level up while sleeping. Not that levels existed. However, to actually make such a system effective, she would need to do a lot of testing regarding exactly what kind of orders she gave and how long they'd take to complete. And while doing all that, it would be best to determine the most efficient ways to earn money and XP. Now that she had so many followers, Rare needed to earn huge amounts of XP. It wasn't something that absolutely needed to be done at any cost, but she did want to be as efficient as possible. Kerry, the feat of hunting this Danuki deserves a reward. I saw the hide that Rumi turned earlier and it was wonderfully done. So, Rami has already been rewarded, but now all of you will also be granted the gift of magic. Rare had Kerry learned there, lightning magic, magical affinity, lightning, and, thunderbolt, skills. Then she had Riley learned there, water magic, magical affinity, water, wash, and, water shot, skills. Ooh, it's finally my turn to get magic. Be boss, you gave me three spells, are you sure about that? R. Well, one of them was, Wash, after all. I didn't want you to think to yourself. That's it? Here, Marion, you as well. She next had Marion learn, Ice Bullet. Now she just had to find a reason to have Remy learn, Flare Arrow, and all them would have some kind of offensive magic spell at their disposal. Thank you, boss. With this, next time I fight the Ant Queen, I can beat her by myself. Maybe? Sugaru was still quite a bit stronger than Marion. But if she got a preemptive attack off, she might have a chance. Right now, Sugaru didn't have any long range attacks. When she had Rumi learn, Flare Arrow, Sugaru should also be given something too. However, Sugaru's build made her pretty unsuited for melee combat. Her style was more to send out her rants. In that case, maybe giving her a skill to buff her own subordinates would be more effective. In any case, Rare had needed a lot of XP. After the ants had all thawed out, she would consult with Sugaru and formulate a plan for this area. The cave needed to be modified so that it was a little more comfortable for humans and ice wolves, and she wanted to teach the Catkin girls more about etiquette. There were just so many things to do. CH22 Oh, that's right, boss, that uh, inventory thing from before, tell us more about it. R, yes, that's right. Damn, she actually remembered. It's probably because her INT went up. But what Rare had said before was just something random she concocted because she didn't feel like explaining it. If we could use it too, then we could have brought this thing back without damaging its hide. Now that she looked at it more closely, there were many little tears in the Danuki all running in the same direction. Since it was even larger than Hakama, they probably had to drag it back here. True, if they had access to an inventory, that would solve this problem perfectly. If all the girls had an inventory, the convenience would be immeasurable. However, the inventory was part of the game system. Players could use it right from the start, but NPCs could not. For the time being, she could just describe how it felt for her when she used her inventory. If they were unable to understand it, she could think about having them learn, space magic, sometime down the line. Not that, space magic, had been confirmed to have any particular relation, it was unclear if there was a skill that functioned similarly to the player inventory. Let me see. I think I said before, but it's like there's an invisible bag that's either right next to me or kind of overlapping my body. I open the mouth of the bag in the palm of my hand, then I can put whatever I want into it. If it's too big and I don't think I can put it in, then I can do this and cover it with a bag. While explaining, Rare put the Danuki pelt into her inventory. And like so. It goes in. No need to use force. The bag's mouth is very large, very flexible, and, well, it's just a very convenient thing to have. It's something that couldn't possibly exist in real life, it could only be actualized in a game. Trying to be any more specific would be difficult. Rare felt that her own explanation became increasingly vague and useless the more she talked, but there was no real other way to explain it. She really had no idea what she was talking about anymore. But if she thought of it as deepening her bonds with her followers, then it didn't feel so bad. Valf. All of a sudden, Hakama barked. Rare blinked in dumbfoundment. The meat that had been laid out right in front of him was gone. He didn't. Eat it. Did he? Yeah, that's not. Huh? What the hell? Did he really eat it all? Just as she was about to shout at him in anger, the meat appeared in front of Hakama. She could scarcely believe her eyes, 
but it looked like he had just taken it out from his inventory, an NPC, or actually, an ice wolf would probably be classified as a regular monster, had just figured out how to access its own inventory, hey look, I can do it too, Marion cried out next, the white cylindrical things she presumed were the tanuki's bones were blinking in and out of existence, Rhea was having trouble following the situation, but if she suppressed her common sense, then if Hakama was able to do it, it would follow that Marion could too. The system didn't discriminate between NPCs and monsters, after all. She was still reeling in confusion, but Rare started to feel more excited than she ever had before. It was common sense for only players to have access to an inventory. However, no player had ever proven that to be an absolute fact. Normally, one could not prove that something was absolutely impossible. This was the so-called devil's proof. There was always the possibility that someone out there could do the impossible but pretended that they couldn't. During the closed beta, whenever a player used their inventory, the NPCs always reacted in surprise, saying I've never met someone who could do that. That was why players always believed that only players were able to use that system. And truly, no one had ever met an NPC who could use their own inventory. However, while no one had encountered an NPC who could use it, that didn't preclude the existence of one who could. The idea that only players had inventories was not only held by players, but by all the NPCs as well. It was just common sense. But the Katkin girls were different. They had never been taught that fact. That's why they expressed interest in Rare's use of the inventory and asked to be shown how to use it themselves. After arriving at this conclusion, Rare felt a shock akin to being smacked in the face. Words she had heard before suddenly came to mind. Those all-important words that the tutorial support AI had imparted, to the system, the only difference between PCs and NPCs is whether or not they can receive system messages. Rare thought those words were meant to encourage players to be ethical. But she was wrong. They meant exactly what they said. Anything players could do, NPCs could also do and even monsters could do. While Rare was still frozen in shock, Marion and Hakama were showing off their inventory skills while trying to explain it at the same time. I kinda get it. And I kinda don't. So frustrating, man. I totally don't understand anything you're saying. Can you start over one more time? As Rare collected herself and observed the others, she suddenly had an epiphany. Hakama and Marion could use inventory. Since they were able to use it right after Rare explained, to them. Her explanation shouldn't have been that difficult to understand. So why couldn't Riley or Kerry do it? And not just them. Ginkgo was being shown by Hakuma, but it was clear that she felt bewildered and a little bit irritated. The wolf pups had all just given up and were playing with the tanuki bones. They had licked all the little bits of meat clinging to them clean off. Since Hakuma and Marion could use it, that at least proved that both monsters and NPCs were capable of accessing their own inventory. That didn't necessarily mean that every character had the capability as well, but if not, then what was the difference? Even though neither of them could do it, as far as Rare could tell, she believed that Kerry and Riley probably had some variance in their comprehension. Perhaps there was a condition that needed to be met. Rare checked her followers' stats. This was probably it. If it was due to a lack of sufficient comprehension, then the ones who could use it and the ones who couldn't should have a difference in stats. And that should be INT. Currently, the two with the most were Marion and Hakuma, who had the same INT value. Next was Rare. But her inclusion wasn't necessary right now. So the next after that were Riley and Rumi, then Ginka, followed by Shukru. Kerry? A moment, sorry, boss, even though you tried to teach us. No, don't worry about it. But I thought I would help you out a bit. Since Rare was a player, she couldn't test it on herself, so for the time being she raised Carrie's INT up to the same as her own. Now, can you try again? What do you think? Can you do it now? Ah, compared to before, it's... But, it still feels like I'm not there yet like I just need a bit more. Looks like she had found the answer. Rare increased Carrie's INT to be the same as Marion's. Ah, I get it now. I need to do this. That's what I needed. I got it, boss. Yes, well done. It was worth spending the time to teach you. Next is Riley and Ginka. Can you come here for a second? This was it. What allowed NPCs to use the inventory was a high INT stat. However, if that were the only condition, then a lot of NPCs would naturally have figured it out on their own. Since she hadn't heard of that being the case, either all the ones who could use it were keeping their mouths shut, or there was another condition that needed to be met. If it were the former, 
Then any NPCs with high INT would try things out when they first encountered it, but if it were the latter, the possibilities she identified as most valid were either they must be a player's follower or someone who can use the inventory has to explain to them how to use it. Or perhaps there was a condition of after learning how to use it, you have to truly believe you yourself can do it too. And when all the right conditions were met, then NPCs could also access their own inventories. No matter what the specifics might be, at present, there was nothing left to investigate. Once Shuguru was completely melted, Rare would have to meet up with her and Rumi to raise their INT and teach them how to use the inventory. CH23 Hakama was left in charge of the Tanuki's meat. Rare told him the wolves could just use whatever they needed for food. Then she and the Katkin girls crawled back into the ant nest. They returned to the provisional queen's room, where Shuguru, who was completely thawed, and Rumi were waiting together. Marion immediately went to brag to Rumi about being able to use inventory. While watching them out of the corner of her eye, Rare dumped a bunch of XP into Rumi's and Shuguru's INT stats. How about you try it too, Rumi? Marion. Why don't you teach her how? It was a good opportunity to see if Rumi could successfully access her inventory with Marion's instructions. At first, the expression she made screamed what the hell is this girl talking about? But after seeing Marion manipulate her inventory a number of times, it immediately clicked for her. The hypothesis that anyone could explain how to use the inventory seemed increasingly likely. Furthermore, seeing someone use it before their very eyes was probably also necessary for learning how to use it. If those were the only conditions, then it would be possible to learn just from watching an explanation from afar. If that were the case, then pretty soon, as more players interacted with more NPCs, there was a chance that the number of NPCs who could use the inventory would increase. If that came to pass, what kind of effect would that have? First, the logistics industry would collapse. Just talking about luggage. Having even a single capable person would be more than sufficient, so horse carriage demand would probably drop like a rock. After carriages, anything related to logistics would suffer irreparable damage, transportation costs would fall dramatically, and even costs of living would decrease. It would probably cause historic deflation. Fresh ingredients could be transported to any location regardless of the distance. Any related services that were valued due to their speed would lose that value. Foodstuffs as a whole would drop in price as a result, aside from any that were naturally limited in availability. Next, the efficiency of mercenaries hunting monsters would skyrocket. Currently, they had to butcher their prey on the spot and only carry what little they could back to town to sell. But now, they could bring the entire corpse back with them, because there was no cost to transporting food and water, there would be no need to pace military campaigns, so no matter how long the journey, no matter how much they hunted, logistics would never be the cause of failure. Supply trains would cease to exist as a concept altogether. And that moved the theorizing to military matters. Whichever country implemented inventories into their armies first would gain the initiative in controlling the continent, and the entire continent would become engulfed in war. With regards to the construction industry, only a single person would be needed to move around any amount of stone and lumber. Expensive furniture would never get damaged in transit either. It would benefit the fishing industry, too. The amount of fish that could be caught at once no longer relied on the size of the boat. Even the farming industry would be affected, whenever there was a bumper crop, freshly harvested produce could be shipped out at a moment's notice. Taken to its extreme, it would be beyond simple to commit tax fraud. It was impossible to interact with anything that was stored in someone else's inventory. And what Rare suddenly realized was along the same lines, but on a completely different scale. After all, with an inventory, one could even argue that a person technically wouldn't even need a home, meaning they wouldn't need land at all anymore. Without being bound by the shackles of land ownership, people wouldn't need to be bound to countries either, and that would cause the economy to collapse. Gold would lose its value and trading would have to be done via jewels and precious metals. If things devolved that far, then no one would be comfortable with their personal information being available to the general public. Most people would still have some kind of profession, but it would be common sense to completely hide it from others. If your assets and home were both hidden, the only form of tax that could be collected was a poll tax, but without a permanent residence, the country couldn't ascertain if someone was a citizen or a visitor from abroad so even that would be hard to collect. Anything that was out in the open could be flawlessly stolen by anyone, 
and there'd be no way to prove it one way or the other, and if no one ever took anything out of their inventories, then dual trades would need to be conducted with trustworthy documents of guarantee. However, until such a system of documentation was developed and became reliable enough, the simple act of trading itself would probably transform into something unrecognizable. If the use of the inventory were ever to spread, it would herald the birth of a completely new economic system. Even after having those ominous thoughts, Rare figured it probably would never actually turn out that way. If this were actually an emulation of another world on hardware powerful enough for a full world simulator, and the entire economy were about to collapse, the system administrators were likely to step in to prevent that, not to mention how improbable it was that things would develop exactly as Rare predicted anyway. This was just like the time she had speculated about the game's AI, Rare was not well versed in economics, she was just influenced by someone close to her that did enjoy thinking about these things. As the proverb went, it's hard to tell a poor thinker from a sleeping one one, in other words, since she didn't know any better she shouldn't think too hard about it. If no one wanted to spread the knowledge, then there was the possibility the technology wouldn't be passed on. Or it was possible that people would just be unable to learn. Right now, Shuguru was also trying to do it, but it didn't seem like she was having much luck. All right Rumi, it looks like you've gotten the hang of it, so I'd like you to try teaching Shuguru. Make sure you're showing her your own inventory. As an example, too. Rumi began to instruct Shuguru on how to use the inventory. Rare decided to check Shuguru's skills, which she had put off before. As she suspected, there were numerous skills she had never seen before. Skills that she couldn't imagine players ever obtaining like, Haplodiploidy, and, Fecundity, piqued her interest somewhat, but what really caught her eye was, Enhance Follower, Str. It was on the list of learnable skills right now, Shuguru didn't have it yet. But Rare couldn't help wondering, if there were a related, enhance follower, MND, skill, and Shuguru had it, would it have been quite as easy to conquer the ant nest? And what intrigued her was that, enhance follower, skill was not off by itself, but it was under the, discipline, skill tree. That meant it should follow how most skill trees worked, after learning, discipline. Anyone could learn the skill as long as they met the prerequisites. The question was how to clear those prerequisites. Now that she knew this skill existed, Red definitely wanted to learn it. If she were to have access to this family of skills, the first thing she imagined was that she wouldn't have to use so much XP on her followers, so it would be a long-term gain in XP spending efficiency. Looking at Sugaru's skills, the prereqs didn't require anything special, or they didn't look like they should. Assuming at least that skills like, Haplodiploidy, and, Fecundity, were out. Rare brought up her own learnable skills screen and tried to find a connecting thread. First, since Sugaru didn't have any magic skills, it was hard to believe that magic would be related. That was when she realized, Shugari didn't have, mental magic. Despite that, she still had, subordinate, which meant that her, subordinate, was a race specialty. This also meant that her, discipline, tree was special, implying that maybe Rare could get the skills she wanted without meeting any prerequisites. In other words, there were no hints to be gained by looking through Shuguru's skills. If these skills were in fact related to magic, then the most likely candidate was, Enchantment Magic. This skills tree contained spells that allowed enchanting people or objects, just as the name said. There, Enchantment Magic, tree didn't have any other skills aside from, Enchantment Magic. But just like with, Alchemy, it was obvious that there were derivative skills, which were mostly all discovered back in the closed beta. These skills were, Enchantment Magic, plus, Fire Magic, equals, Enhancement Magic, Str. Enchantment Magic, plus, Water Magic, equals, Enhancement Magic, MND. Enchantment Magic, plus, Wind Magic, equals, Enhancement Magic, Agi. Enchantment Magic, plus, Earth Magic, equals, Enhancement Magic, Fit. In all likelihood, once she learned a given, Enhancement Magic, spell, it should also unlock the corresponding, Enhance Follower, skill. If her conjectures turned out to be wrong, she wasn't planning to participate directly in combat much herself, so she wasn't opposed to learning a suitable element of magic. The bigger problem was whether this experiment would cost her a huge amount of XP or not. Once Shuguru was completely melted, 
Rare would have to meet up with her and Remy to raise their INT and teach them how to use the inventory. TL notes 1, comma literally, having, poor, uninformed thoughts is akin to sleeping. CH24. After teaching Kerry and the other girls magic and raising their INT high enough for them to access their inventories, right now Rare only had 144 XP left. Enchantment magic, took 20. The cheapest elemental magic would cost another 20, enhancement magic, was yet another 20, and finally, enhance follower, was the sole 40. If these calculations were correct, then she'd only be able to learn one type of enhancement for now. In order to raise the group's safety margins, she wanted to boost VIT. However, considering all the battles she'd seen so far, the Catkin girls had never taken a serious hit. Well, technically. There was that ambush where she had established first contact, but that had nothing to do with stats, Rare had used her family's secret techniques, so it didn't count. Or like, she had already decided to erase that ambush from the chronicles of their first meeting anyway. That meant the next best stat to improve would certainly be Agi. It provided the most synergy for both the Catkin girls and the Ice Wolves. The problem was the ants, but, strictly speaking, they were Shuguru's followers so they shouldn't be eligible for rares, enhance follower, skills. All she had to do was use the remaining 44 XP to have Shuguru take, enhance follower, though, then the ants would also have a buff available to them. On the other hand, another approach was to go offensive, depleting more of an enemy's forces in an initial attack was a viable strategy. Since rares forces were numerous, they simply had more hands to play. If those hands were powerful enough, then most opponents could simply be crushed with brute force. The best candidates for that strategy were STR and INT, now that everyone had both magical and physical attacks at their disposal. To take someone by surprise, or to knock an opponent off balance, it might be better to focus more on magical attacks. After all, their side consisted of beastkin, wolves, and ants. They'd never expect magic to suddenly be flung in their faces. Yet another approach would be to learn an element of magic that no one else could currently use, so that the diversity of attacks at their disposal increased. The options here would be, earth magic, or, wind magic, which meant Vitor Agi. After mulling it over, since never being hit meant taking no damage, and not being able to hit was useless too, the choice was clear, Rare went for Agi. She picked up, wind magic s. Air cutter. She also considered, desiccate, but she felt that wouldn't contribute to the team's variety. Next she learned, enchantment magic, and, enhancement magic, Aggie. And in the all-important, discipline, skill tree, as predicted, enhance follower, Aggie, was unlocked. So now, until I've learned all these skills, I'll need to funnel all of our XP into myself. In order to master the entire category, they would need to farm up another 300 XP. Rare grimaced at the thought, and now to check the all-important, enhance follower, Agus effects. The skill read, increases the Agia of all your followers by 10% of your own Agia. Holy cow, it's a passive skill. That means it should stack with, enhancement magic. Wait, huh? That also means, if that was the case, then if Shuguru also learned, enhance follower, Agi 10% of Rare's Aga would count towards Shuguru's Aga which would trickle down to all the other ants. Hot damn. It was probably incredibly unlikely for a character with, subordinate, to control someone else with, subordinate. However, once both Rare and Shuguru had all their, enhance follower, skills, depending on Rare's own stats, it was becoming more and more likely that the ants would end up becoming the primary attack force. But first. I haven't actually verified if I even get XP when the ants beat something. Most of them are still frozen, though. Crap. Thinking logically, any XP the ants earned would go to the queen, and any XP the queen received would go to rare, so as far as XP was concerned they should count like any other follower. In any case, the ants were all thawing out right now. For the time being, Shuguru should also get, enhance follower, Agi. She had been messing around with her inventory but pause to look over at Rare and nod. Now the group only had 4 XP left. They really needed to go out and earn more, but it was also important to shore up the base. She wanted to thaw out all the ants first, but there was something else that had to be done before that. Kerry, Riley, Remy, Marion. You've truly done good work today. I think it's time you had some rest. None of you have had an opportunity to sleep for very long, have you? No, 
We're, it's important to get real sleep. You won't be able to operate at your best otherwise. Don't worry, I'll work you hard when you wake up, so just rest for now. For now, she'd have the mountain cat girls rest up. Fortunately, they had the hide that Remy had done here. After half forcing them to go to sleep, Rare took Sugaru into the next room. This room was still full of frozen ants but it looked like about half of them had thawed out. The ones closest to the entrance seemed like they were nearly back to normal, even with the queen's guidance. These ants were moved over to a room that hadn't been frozen, one of the ones that Rare's group hadn't gone through in their raid. In that room, all the ants turned at that same time to stare at Rare, Wah. as one. The ants then all looked down. While they weren't Rare's direct followers, it seemed they would faithfully abide by her will and follow her orders. Ah. My apologies, I didn't mean it. I don't mind if you look at me. I'm the boss now. I'll be relying on you. Rare looked back over at all the ants. She didn't observe them closely during the raid since her group had just used, charm, and, freeze, to wipe them all out en masse. But now that she was re-evaluating them, she noticed that there were lots of different types of ants. There weren't all infantry ants. Rare couldn't check the ants' statuses so she had Sugaru do it. While she could somehow communicate with them as Sugaru's followers, she was unable to see anything specific, like names or titles. According to the Queen, she could see this information on her own skill window, so Rare opened Sugaru's skills up again to check. The most likely candidate was, Haplodiploidy. This wasn't a skill in another tree, but the name of a skill tree itself. Haplodiploidy, was a skill exclusive to Vespoid Queens and listed underneath it were options like, infantry. It seemed the skills here corresponded to the types of ants that the queen could produce. In other words, the ants were born as that type to begin with. This would explain why the nest didn't have any eggs or ant larvae. The other available types aside from, infantry, were, combat engineer, and, cavalry. There, combat engineer, skill created an ant of a different color than the infantry ants called, engineer ant. But Rare wondered what, cavalry, did, maybe ants riding on something else? It was an amusing thought, but apparently it just referred to a higher rank of ant above infantry. In terms of fighting ability, though, it seemed the difference in strength was equivalent to how much stronger a mounted knight was over a foot soldier. However, it cost quite a lot of LP and MP to produce one as well. In any case, what interested Rare right now was the engineer ant. If they were really combat engineers, then it followed that this nest was probably constructed by them. The tunnels with the smooth walls must have been the result of some kind of skill. She wanted to see how they dug tunnels. The engineer ant bent its body, stuck the end of its abdomen out, and sprayed out some kind of foul-smelling liquid. Ants in real life did the same thing. Real ants sprayed venom or formic acid, but the stuff the engineer ants sprayed began to melt the solid rock wall. With such a deadly solution in their bodies, even able to melt stone, Predators must think twice about eating them. They appeared to have much more firepower than one would expect from combat engineers. But no, apparently, the liquid had no effect on anything but rock. She had them spray some of the other ants nearby, but their exoskeletons were just fine. Rare gingerly touched the liquid herself, but it didn't do anything to her aside from producing a sensation of stinging pain. This sure was some magical acid. The queen explained that it wasn't that it could only melt stone, but, to put it in game terms, it was dependent on the type of mineral, or more specifically the rarity of the mineral. So stuff like calcium could also be melted, which includes human bones. But I touched it just now and my nails are fine. Rare was too high leveled, so it wouldn't affect her. Apparently, having XP invested seemed to determine a living thing's rank. To put it another way, a player who had just started the game could have their nails and equipment melted. Maybe to a beginner skeleton player they might find this acid to be their worst nightmare. Considering how many starting cave areas there were, though, if someone did spawn in one with ants, they must have the worst of luck. CH25 Rare immediately had the engineers start digging a tunnel that connected the wolves' den directly to the queen's chamber. She was initially planning to just widen the route she had originally taken during the raid on the nest, but a direct route would be shorter. There were ten engineers who could work. So for now she'd have them all take turns working on it. She would then have any other engineers who recovered start working on a new tunnel that connected to the old mountain cat base. While the engineers got started, Rare wanted to look into Sugaru's, Haplodiploidy, 
skill tree more. Considering the skill names and the type of ants that could be produced, the three current options, infantry, combat engineer, and cavalry, couldn't be the only ones. There should be ways to unlock more types, like say, artillery. Actually, isn't this part just like a strategy game? Strategy games were fun in their own right, but only when the rules were made clear beforehand. Right now, there were five, infantry, and one, cavalry, ready for action. They had been grouped together and sent out to patrol the cave's surroundings. The six of them formed a squad. For the time being, there wouldn't be different ranks of squads, they just be mixed like this. She could use this group to determine an operational cost-benefit analysis of the ants based on the XP and resources they earned. Then she could come up with strategies and apply them within the boundaries of the game rules. There just weren't enough ants this time, so the squad was almost all infantry, but in the future it would be better if each squad had a more balanced makeup. This would include engineers, and, if they existed, artillery. That said, as far as actual military activities went, as long as they didn't pick a fight with one of the six countries, their enemies wouldn't be organizations or militaries but private forces at best. In which case, for the most part, even if their side only had the weaker types of soldiers available, they should still be pretty much unbeatable. By the way, Sugaru, did you spend any XP on your ant followers stats at all? Currently. Rare didn't have enough XP to spend on the hundreds of ants on her side, but she wanted to know how their status was. It seemed, though, that Sugaru never gave them much thought and just treated them like disposable pawns. If that were the case, then no matter, or rather, being able to work this army to the bone without worrying about the consequences was perfect. They could even be replenished by using Sugaru's LP and MP. It was like being able to grow and harvest soldiers from your own field. And potions basically became fertilizer. The possibilities excited Rare. Speaking of disposable, what happens when ants die? Is there some kind of penalty? Like maybe they get weaker for a period of time. Specifically, do they lose XP? Or maybe is the individual ant itself lost forever? Sugaru seemed unclear on the details. If the corpse could be recovered, it was. But after confirming that it was dead, it would disappear. And since she didn't have a revive skill, she didn't know if they could be revived at all. She only ever considered pure numbers, so it was faster to just produce a new ant over reviving a dead one. She had just never thought about it. Incidentally, it appeared that Sugaru didn't have an accurate grasp on the total number of ants under her control. Rare had never heard of running an army without knowing its exact composition, but that seemed indicative of how little value the ants lives had. However, she didn't want to treat Kerry, Hakuma, and the others that way. She wanted to come up with some method of reviving them in case the worst ever came to pass. That said, she was pretty sure no revive skills had been discovered yet. In any case, what was important now was to build up military strength, at the very least. She wanted Shuguru to be constantly producing more ants at a rate that matched her natural LP and MP region. Well, having you at full LP and MP is a waste. So let's have you use some up. For now, let's increase our engineers. There's a mountain of work to do, and it's not like engineers can't fight at all. When incorporated into combat squads, they can be used for diversions and a smoke screen from a distance. Not to mention, most people won't be able to tell the difference between infantry and engineers anyway, so they'll be good for intimidation. Actually, looking at them closer, they were slightly different in color. It was hard to tell in the dark, though. Is there a room you can use for production? The girls are using the queen's room right now. The entire cave was controlled by their allies, so it didn't really matter where she did it. In that case, this room here was as good as any other. According to the help documentation, there were no larvae, they were born as full-fledged ants. She was mildly interested in exactly what kind of life forms they were supposed to be. Rare watched the birthing process closely while simultaneously monitoring Sugaru's status. Engineers, weren't that expensive, so she could pop out several eggs without worry. Or like, I didn't realize she actually laid eggs. Ah, they're already hatching. Rather than shattering, the surface of the egg ripped apart like fabric, and from within a dark brown, engineer ant, emerged. The five newly born, engineer ants, already began lining up before her. This meant they already had a sense of self-awareness. Insect monsters developed really fast. So if I said I want, infantry, right now, K 
Can you make them immediately? Is there any kind of cool down? Shuguru explained that, infantry, could be produced right away. But it was currently impossible to make more, engineers. While there was no system limit on how many eggs could be laid at once. The maximum effective number was based on how much LP and MP she had. With regards to the current situation, it was possible to produce, infantry, right after making, engineers, but the cool down for, engineer, would be frozen until, infantry, finished cooling down. In other words, it worked the same as it did for casting magic. It was nice that they shared the same system. I appreciate the explanation. It was very easy to understand. It was easy, but, man. It really is inconvenient that you can't talk. It wouldn't help when we're far apart though. If there were a skill like, contact follower, or something, that would address all her concerns, but none of the skills that she could learn looked like they fit the bill, and there was nothing promising in Sugary's skills either. Is there really nothing? Something that lets me communicate with my followers in my head. It would be best if it was something that allowed us to talk when we're far apart. Something like telepathy, or a long range phone call. So actually, all of Rare's followers, including Kerry, could access their own inventories now. That was a result of reversing the words she had heard during the tutorial, about how the system saw nearly no difference between players and NPCs, in which case, maybe, if I added my followers as friends, couldn't I chat with them via friend chat? CH26. Let's have Sugaru act as the first test subject. Sugaru. I'm going to add you as a friend. Right now. There was no reason not to tell it to her straight. Shuguru looked back at her blankly. This wasn't exactly the response she was expecting. Rare wondered what she had to do to add a friend. Normally, just asking do you want to be friends? Would work. However, what mattered here was how the game defined friends. How exactly did one become friends with someone else? The sinister darkness that plagued modern society gushed forth from within and that commonly accepted method of making friends in real life paralyzed her body for a brief moment. If the system operated in largely the same way, then similar actions should lead to similar results. First was to try what two players would do when they wanted to friend each other. Unfortunately, Rare never wanted to friend anyone during the closed beta. All the account data would be wiped at the end of the test, after all, and she just had too much fun exploring all the game systems which wasn't what most players wanted to do. In this open bait too as well, she didn't have any players she wanted to friend. Rare had to rely on a help documentation again. How to friend players. Should work. And search. Managing your friend list. In order to add someone to your friend list, you need a friend card. Friend cards are created whenever you retrieve them from your inventory. You will always have access to your own friend card. What you take out from your inventory is always a copy. Give your friend card to another player and have them store it in their inventory to become friends. If you would like to remove a friend, take their friend card and destroy it or throw it away. Removed friends can be friended again by repeating the same steps again. Oh, I see. It was a simple system, basically like exchanging business cards. Rare checked her own inventory and found the friend card section. You could see the all contents of your inventory via the menu. But to take something out without using the system you had to focus on the specific item. And PCs wouldn't be able to understand the concept of friend cards, so friending could only be initiated by players. Rare gave the friend card she retrieved to Shuguru and told her to store it in her inventory. You have become friends with, Shuguru. And just like that, they were friends. Now, how do I access friend chat again? Or oh well, I've never done it before. Ah. Here we go. Shuguru jumped in surprise. You should also be able to communicate with me in the same way. Can you try it? Think of my name in your head, then feel your thoughts being directed to me. Greater than dot dot boss 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 boss. Ah, was that successful? Are we connected? Greater than. Oh, you did it. Now, no matter how far apart we are, we can still talk. We don't need to speak aloud, either, so it's perfect for discussing topics in secret. Greater than. The Katkin girls still spoke to her rather casually, but Shuguru was a bit more formal. Or rather, Shuguru wasn't actually using formal speech, but her thoughts were being translated into this form of speech to Ra. Friend chat was logged and stored temporarily, so that was probably why it automatically got translated into human speech. Now that she knew friend chat could be used, 
the number of hands she could play would increase rapidly. And now, after having investigated the followers she'd obtained so far, Rare found herself arriving at a single startling conclusion, if NPCs could use the system the same way that players could, and if the system didn't distinguish between players and NPCs as far as gameplay went, then there was nothing preventing players from being tamed. If this were actually true, then she could siphon all the XP that other players had gathered for herself. Kind of like how some female characters get worshipped by male players, carried through content, and given free stuff. 1. Since your avatar moved based on your actual body, and you used your own voice to speak, it was relatively hard to fake your sex in this game just like in other VR games, but it wasn't impossible. Therefore, so-called Nakama, too, did exist out there. And if her thinking was correct, even XP could be donated in this game. It was possible that this darkness that has existed throughout the history of online gaming was crystallizing into a more perfect form here. That said, in terms of what could be done in the game, it was really hard to imagine a system that breached to user's consent. If a player really did get tamed, the system would probably throw some kind of warning or system error message and allow them to void the effect. That would be a big difference compared to NPCs. That line from the tutorial, the only difference between PCs and NPCs is whether or not they can receive system messages, might refer to this. Rare itch to go try it out. However, if she were to test it at this point in time, the existence of, subordinate, would definitely become public, in which case, she could only test it on an exceptionally trustworthy player. Furthermore, that player would have to consent to possibly being tamed by Rare. As could be expected, Rare didn't have any such confidant, or more like, she didn't really know anyone period. Now that she thought of it, she hadn't seen any other players yet. But she wondered how many started in monster territory. And if those players were far outnumbered by the total possible spawn points in monster territory, then it could be effectively impossible to find anyone to cooperate with or friend. There was a really high chance that a given person in the game world could never meet any other player. What would you do if you wanted to play with your friends? Regardless, Rare didn't really want to play with friends anyway, so she didn't care either way. If there was any content she'd have a hard time beating solo. She could just have Kerry and the other girls come along. If necessary, she could raise their INT even more. Then they would probably be better than a random shitty player anyway. What a wonderful system she'd stumbled upon. She had nothing but gratitude for the developers who came up with it. Once the girls woke up, she'd have them work on their manners. After they had more XP to spare, she also wanted to raise their INT and aim for them to be the actually capable elite for a specific qualification that doesn't come up in stories very often. For the right now, they would wait for all the ants to recover, suppress the surrounding forest, and save up XP. Once sugar is LP and MP recovered and she could produce more ants, their saved XP would be spent on acquiring more enhanced follower skills for both rare and sugar. But first, let's focus on conquering the entire forest. 1. The literal term is Heim play which specifically means when players treat a female character like a princess, pampering them, giving them items, and protecting them from harm. There's a definition that someone posted on Nico Nico. 2. Nikama originates from Neto Kama, where Okama is slang for homosexual men. However, Nikama are not strictly homosexual, the term refers specifically to the behavior of a man who pretends to be a woman online. There is no inherent motive ascribed to the term Nikama. 